1842, in his poem Ulysses, Alfred Lord Tennyson wrote, I meet and dole unequal laws unto a savage race that hoard and sleep and feed and know not me. I cannot rest from travel. I am a part of all that I have met. Yet all experience is an arch, where through gleams that untraveled world whose margin fades forever and forever when I move. This gray spirit yearns in desire to follow knowledge like a sinking star beyond the utmost bound of human thought. The lights begin to twinkle from the rocks. The long day wanes. The slow moon climbs. The deep moans round with many voices. Come, my friends. Tis not too late to seek a newer world. All experience is an arch. Where through gleams that untraveled world whose margin fades forever and forever when I move. You know, if there were no other reason to live than a glimpse that untraveled world through the arch of our experience, it would be wonderfully worthwhile. But add to that the fact that no two of us sees the untraveled world, the future, and what it holds in the same way. We cannot, because no two of us is alike. In fact, there never have been two people who were exactly alike in all the millions of years of man's development, nor will there ever be, excluding single-egg twins, which are, in effect, one person in two bodies. In his excellent book, The Social Contract, Robert Audrey gives us the reason that no two of us can be exactly alike. The principle is that of recombination. In the act of conception, two parents with different combinations of paired genes contribute half of the resources of each to what becomes a new genetic proposal. The fertilized egg, this randomly determined recombination of parental possibilities, is an accident of staggering possibilities. Theodosius Dobzhansky, an inheritor of Morgan's fruit flies, and today, philosophically, the most uh, equalitarian of geneticists, has described the theoretical Mendelian consequences this way. If the parents have five pairs of genes, then there are 32 possible recombinations. If they have 20 pairs, then the possibilities amount to 1,048,576. If they have 32 pairs, then over 2 billion new opportunities confront the offspring. Yet the simplest of animals has genes in the hundreds, and the human being has far over 10,000. We have no comprehensible mathematics to describe the chance against recombination producing two identical human beings. It's a job even our most advanced new generation computers would just sit and short circuit over. Even in the case of brothers and sisters, the chance is one in a trillion that any two siblings will be genetically alike, even though they have the same parents. The accident, which determines in such large part what you or I will be, prohibits identicality. Every month, a new egg slips into the womb of the female of the species, and no two eggs are alike. Male sperm is produced in amounts beyond counting, yet no two are alike. And in the first trial of natural selection, there is no determination as to which sperm will have the superior luck or vigor to win the race to the egg and fertilize it. The magnitude of the competition is such that although only one human being will be the normal consequence of the achievement, still a single teaspoonful of male sperm would be sufficient to father every person alive on the earth today, and all would be different. Every human being conceived by sexual recombination is a genetic accident. Every individual being is thus a pioneer, a biological adventure, a brand new first-time person on earth. No one like you can exist in your species. Common heredity may provide a common disposition among contemporaries or a limited likeness between ancestor and descendant. But the strategy of sex denies the prison of identicality. If you were not created equal, and here we must ask equal to what or to whom, you were yet created free. So we stand, you and I, in the arch of our experience and face the untraveled world of tomorrow. Here it's good to remember the quotation from the book, The Nature of Man. Man tends to achieve his being inasmuch as he develops love and reason. Now, with these obviously great goals before us, the development of love and reason, and the awareness of the world of opportunity that lies before us, well, things can get much better and a whole lot more interesting. But, as Pierre Berteau writes in The Future of Man, what is man and who is man? Whom and what do we mean exactly when we say that word? In this context, we normally mean the Western white civilized male adult, who is in fact only a very small percentage of the human race. Even if we consider, perhaps rightly, that this sort of human being outweighs in importance the rest of humanity. But if we take another index, for instance, a statistical one, 
We would mean and consider as typical for mankind the largest race, age, and sex group. That is, young Chinese females. I like that quotation because, like a bucket of ice water in our face, it straightens us up, opens our eyes, and makes us see humanity from the standpoint of love and reason in an entirely new light. Our rewards will be in proportion to our service. We are here to serve other human beings. We will grow through the arch of our experience into the opportunities of tomorrow to the extent that we develop love and reason. Now let's look at our opportunities for what they really are, not local or regional or national or continental, but global, universal. How can what we do help human beings everywhere on Earth, serve human beings everywhere on Earth, and do it from the standpoint of our originality as persons? It gives a whole new dimension to the word opportunity, doesn't it? But why then do we seem to move so tentatively, so fearfully, through the arch of our experience into the unknown? Russell has written that our instinctive emotions are those that we have inherited from a much more dangerous world and contain, therefore, a larger portion of fear than they should. We mentioned the geneticist Theodosius Dobzhansky. In his book, Man Evolving, he writes, By changing what he knows about the world, man changes the world he knows. And by changing the world in which he lives, man changes himself. And Dr. Frederick L. Polak, in his book, The Future of Man, writes, Through his images of the future, we come to know man, who he is, and how he wishes to be, what his thoughts are, what he values most highly, what he thinks is worth striving for, and whether he thinks it's attainable. Certain types of men hold certain types of visions, subject to their temper and spirit. Tell me what your vision of the future is, and I'll tell you what you are. Well, what's your vision of the future? Your future and the future of man. Do you believe that Harvey Cox in his book, The Feast of Fools, that man is a transient eczema on a small planet in a third-rate galaxy? Or with Arthur Kessler in The Ghost in the Machine, that evolution has been compared to a labyrinth of blind alleys, and there's nothing very strange or improbable in the assumption that man's native equipment, though superior to that of any other living species, nevertheless contains a deficiency which predisposes him towards self-destruction. Both could be right. Lauren Isley, in his book, The Unexpected Universe, writes, The evolutionists, piercing beneath the show of momentary stability, discovered, hidden in rudimentary organs, the discarded rubbish of the past. They detected the reptile under the lifted feathers of the bird, the lost terrestrial limbs dwindling beneath the blubber of the giant cetaceans. They saw life rushing outward from an unknown center, just as today the astronomer senses the galaxies fleeing into the infinity of darkness. As the spinning galactic clouds hurl stars and worlds across the night, so life, equally impelled by the centrifugal powers lurking in the germ cell, scatters the splintered radiance of consciousness and sends it prowling and contending through the thickets of the world. We know that we become what we think about most of the time. Well, what do you think about most of the time? Repeating Dr. Pollock's quote, Through his images of the future, we come to know man, who he is, and how he wishes to be, what his thoughts are, what he values most highly, what he thinks is worth striving for, and whether he thinks it's attainable. Certain types of men hold certain types of visions, subject to their temper and spirit. Tell me what your vision of the future is, and I will tell you what you are. You can tell what you value most highly by assessing your past decisions, by seeing what you have, in fact, achieved, what you possess, what you place importance upon, what you felt has been worth striving for, what you wish to be, what you value most highly. When we look at ourselves in the light of our originality and realize we still cling to vestigial fears no longer needed, as useless as the disappearing limbs of the whale, as we stand in the arch of our experience and see the untraveled world before us, despite the nagging doubts that must plague us from time to time, I think we have to agree with Tennyson's Ulysses and say, Come, my friends, it is not too late to seek a newer world. I got my inspiration for this piece when I reread one of the Markets of Change series, which appeared in 1970 in Kaiser News, published by Kaiser Aluminum and Chemical Corporation and edited by Don Fabin. That was one of the finest series of publications I've ever had the joy of reading. And I feel genuinely sorry for any person who did not have the opportunity to read and own them. The artwork and the typography were as great as the original and scholarly writing. And I've often wondered if Mr. Fabin and his friends went on to found a publication of their own once the series ended. 
In the one from which I took the quotation from Tennyson and some of the other quotes, which is on ecology, number one of the Markets of Change series, 1970, it begins, Once upon a time, there evolved upon this planet an organism that was ill-suited for survival. It could not run fast enough to escape its enemies. If caught, its teeth and claws were small protection. It was too big to hide under a leaf and too weak to burrow deeply into the ground. To survive, it took refuge in caves where a fire at the entrance kept predators at bay. If the fire ran out of fuel, this creature could hurl rocks and thus drive all but the most determined enemies away. Its security was measured by the amount of firewood it could accumulate and the number of rocks it could gather and store in the cave against the terrors of the night. Now, you see, this was a very important sort of thing. All other creatures grew bigger teeth or learned to run faster. Alone among all the creatures on Earth, the one we're describing turned to things for its survival. This was, in the end, to make all the difference. After a while, this creature learned to cultivate some edible plants to supplement the food it could get by gathering and hunting. Growing food was at best uncertain, and in any event depended on the seasons, which could not be controlled. And the creature began to store its surplus foods. His security against the vagaries of nature was measured by how much he could grow and how much he could store. His feelings for being at least partly in control of his destiny was based on the gathering of things. While being was measured quantitatively, the more the better. From the very beginning, he was motivated by fear, fear of pain, fear of death, fear that there wouldn't be enough. In time, this creature's activities produced so much that it became more convenient to represent the accumulation of things by other things, smaller and easier to carry or to exchange. These symbols, although intrinsically of no value, assumed the same value as things, and men, or at least most men, became engaged in the acquisition and accumulation of the symbols of things. They did this even when they no longer had any need for them. The symbols were the surrogates for the rocks piled in the cave against the coming of the night. Now think of this system as being reinforced over and over through hundreds of generations and thousands of years through social approval, ritualization, and acculturation. That there was something basically wrong with this way of life may be exemplified by the fact that those who refused to subscribe to the accumulation and storage of things, Christ, Muhammad, Buddha, became the founders of the world's great religions. Well, the idea is not to stop collecting our rocks entirely, especially if we have families to think about, now and in the future. The idea is to collect our rocks wisely, or in these days, just collect a few. I attended a conference in Palo Alto, California recently, sponsored by the College of Financial Planners, of which I'm a regent, and where one of the excellent speakers, Mr. Philip L. Ramsdale, pointed out that 96% of the American people fail to achieve financial independence. The reasons for the virtual total state of impecuniousness rampant in the world's richest country are four. One, the high cost of living, that is, price and wage spirals, inflation. Two, the high cost of living high, consumerism, and the credit card society and philosophy where people in the millions are searching frantically for things to buy instead of putting the same money to work in income-producing property or investments. Three, High taxes and multiple taxes and taxes on top of taxes. Taxes which make our real take-home income look like a sheared sheepdog. A family finds it's earning $20,000 a year, according to the latest raise in pay. The man and his wife are ecstatic. What they fail to realize is that the raise in pay has only kept pace with the rising cost of living. But at the same time, the raise in pay has placed them in a new tax bracket. They're now paying more taxes on money, which does not constitute a raise in real pay at all. But they don't realize that, and they move to a larger house, basing their choice of home on the old funny multiple of four times annual income. But they think their annual income is 20000 a year, when in actuality, it's more like 12000 And they start living on 20000 a year, and trying to pay for it with twelve. And it's then they find themselves getting behind what's known as the power curve, according to Mr. J. Chandler Peterson from Atlanta, an expert on financial planning. They find themselves borrowing money this year to pay last year's income taxes, then find that they have to pay this year's taxes, plus the amount they borrowed, plus the amount it takes to live on their new higher standard, which is based on the amount of money they're not really earning anyway. Add to this the higher cost of living, everything from schools and lawn tools to eggs and gasoline, our new young executive with his Brooks Brothers suit and Sears Roebuck underwear finds that he's developed an entirely new capacity for sweating and lying with his eyes wide open in the dark. So number one is the high cost of living. 
Number two is the high cost of living high. Number three is high taxes. And number four, according to the very knowledgeable Philip L. Ramsdell, president of Combined Financial Corporation, headquartered in San Jose, California. Number four is the high cost of leaving, which in all likelihood will bring Mrs. Executive face-to-face for the first time in her life with the costs of probate and the wolves of the IRS with regard to estate taxes. As one man at the conference put it, at one time we all lived in a large pasture in which we were free to frolic, work, eat, and reproduce. And then the government cut the pasture in half, and we found ourselves with less room to play in. Then it was cut in half again, and again, and again. Anyway, it's not too difficult to see why 96% of the American people wind up flat, broke, and disillusioned about how to play the collect the rocks for the cave game. Now, it's true that some people are able to collect these symbol of things, money, even when they no longer need it. But they constitute perhaps one half of one percent of the population. And it's perhaps better to have a few more rocks than you need, since none of us knows for sure how long he's going to live and need them, than it is to run out of them entirely when we're 65 and still have 15 to 20 good years ahead of us. Let me try to remember an example of how what seems to look good can be something entirely different in reality. It was an example given by Mr. Chandler Peterson of Atlanta. Let's say you have $10,000 invested at 10% compounded, a very handsome rate of interest, you'll agree. That brings you a return of $1,000. But you're on the 50% tax bracket, which cuts that down to 500 Add state and local taxes, which take another 6% or 7% bite, and you've got 460 or something, and we're being very generous. The rate of inflation this past year was figured at 7%. Well, when Mr. Peterson got through, you had a net return on your 10% of $10,000 of, get this, Minus two and a half percent. What looked like a truly regal return on your money was in actuality putting you in the hole. That's why the majority of working people in our society have a negative cash flow. Earnings do not produce security. We need to put that ten thousand dollars into a tax deductible investment that will produce no current taxable income, that will produce tax free build up, and eventually, when we need it, a tax favored payout, such as capital gains. In addition, we need an orderly method of transferring our estate at debt through an IRS-approved investment and trust arrangement. But first, we need to find the income to work with our financial planner so that we can create a meaningful estate. And to do that, we must either augment our means or diminish our wants, as Ben Franklin suggested. We must live within our means, whatever those means happen to be. If we can theoretically afford to live in a $100,000 home, Let's live in a $50,000 number and agree to apply the two-point common-sense rule to everything we buy or want to buy. Whenever we find ourselves facing a buying situation, we test it against two questions. One, do I really need it? Is it necessary? And two, can I afford it? The second question should be based on an actual understanding of what our true income is after taxes, after expenses, and after provision for our future. At the seminar... A case was brought out about a high-income doctor who faced imminent bankruptcy. He was deeply in debt, owed last year's taxes, and was living beyond his means. Working with his financial planner, in two years he was debt-free and saving money the right way. It's seldom too late to get squared away, but we must guard against letting our living standard go up as our income goes up, because as a rule, it's not a real increase in income at all. It's just keeping pace with inflation and putting us in progressively higher income tax brackets. Albert Camus wrote in his notebooks, It is a kind of spiritual snobbery that makes people think they can be happy without money. And if you don't think he's right, try it sometime. Ogden Nash in The Terrible People wrote, Certainly there are lots of things in life that money won't buy, but it's very funny. Have you ever tried to buy them without money? What do those who are trying to help the poor and the disadvantaged want? They want to need money. They clamor for federal and state money. They need federal and state money, but that money comes from hard-working people. It comes out of the money earner's pocketbook, whether it's a person or a company. All of it comes from taxes. We need to clean up the ghettos. It takes money to do it. We need to build whole new clean communities, better schools. We need to tear down the rat-ridden, mind-grinding, spirit-killing human dumps that exist in our big cities and replace them with cleanliness and order. It can only be done with money and more money. In Major Barbara, G.B. Shaw wrote, The seven deadly sins, food, clothing, heat, rent, taxes, respectability, and children. Nothing can lift those seven millstones of man's neck but money. And the spirit cannot soar until the millstones are lifted. 
You know, millions live under the weight of a constant pressure, are torn by a ridiculous ambivalence that there's somehow something wrong with money, that money is evil, that to think about money, a plan how to earn more money, indeed to earn a lot of money, is, is wrong somehow. It's often, strangely enough, good old mother who puts such thoughts into innocent young heads. As someone commented recently, the hand that rocks the cradle is also the hand that louses up Charlie. Yet that same mother would have been, and even may have been, in a heck of a fix without money for good shelter, warm clothing, good food, medical care, and some of the amenities of life. Getting back to G.B. Shaw, he also wrote, Money is indeed the most important thing in the world, and all sound and successful personal and national morality should have this fact for its basis. Remember, as Logan Pearsall Smith put it, there are few sorrows, however poignant, in which a good income is of no avail. The myth that there's something evil in money was put in the minds of the masses by those who had all the money. Keeping poor and stupid and we'll stay rich was the slogan of the rich in those days. Today we know that the best thing that can happen to people, to all of the people, is a measure of affluence, a substantial, more than adequate income. You know, Karl Marx's mother once said, if Karl, instead of writing a lot about capital, made a lot of capital, it would have been much better. There was a mother who knew what she was talking about. If all we did was sit under a tree and meditate and pass wisdom along to passing strangers or wander the country teaching a better life with no wives, children, mortgages, taxes, dogs, schools, medical bills, automobiles, clothing, food, transportation, and clubs to concern ourselves about, we wouldn't have to pile rocks in our cave. But most of us seem to want these things, despite their onerous cost, and so maybe it's a good idea to find ways of having them without sweating ourselves into an early grave. While I was at the International Financial Planners Association Conference in Palo Alto, I also ran across an interesting book for those who think the best way to augment their means is through a business of their own. The title of the book is Up Your Own Organization by Donald M. Dibble, who was at the conference and who gave me an autographed copy. As you might guess from the title, which is a play on Robert Townsend's book, Up Your Organization, Up Your Own Organization has an introduction by Robert Townsend, former chairman of the board of Avis Renicar Corporation. In his introduction, Townsend writes, See Northcote Parkinson as the discoverer of Parkinson's law. Work expands so as to fill the time available for its completion. He has also written about the automatic growth that takes place in organizations. For instance, he related the number of ships in the British Navy to the number of people working in their equivalent of the Navy Department. He discovered that when the number of ships began to decline, the number of people continued to grow. Ten years after that discovery, the number of ships is still declining, and the number of people in that department is still growing. When the British Empire began to dissolve, he discovered that the number of people employed to administer the affairs of the empire continued to grow. To this day, the number is still rising, even though the empire has disappeared. His most recent discovery is that if everything continues on course, by the year 2195, everyone in Britain will be working for the government. One of our large banks got interested in this, did some research, and came to the conclusion that if the trends of the last ten years continue, everyone in America will be working for the government by the year 2049. Now, that's less than 80 years from now. Meanwhile, the concentration of economic power continues. Anthony Jay, in his new book, Corporation Man, published by Random House, concludes, It seems almost inevitable that, well before the end of this century, most of the wealth of the Western world will be controlled by three to six hundred giant international corporations. The only argument now is about the exact number. And Townsend goes on to say, As an escapee from both the American Express Company and the International Telephone and Telegraph Company, as a long-time non-admirer of big government, and as an ardent lover of human beings as individuals, I must confess that I'd almost rather see the kids reduce the country to rubble than see it pass into the clammy hands of a few hundred politicians and top corporation executives. The only thing standing in the way may be the person with enough guts to check security and start his own business. This book, Up Your Own Organization, is for that person. To me, he and his ilk are the last remnants of humanity, the only real human beings left. This book is for the individual who has been wondering for a long time whether life has to be the way it is in that big organization he or she works for. 10% chicken salad and 90% chicken you-know-what. Wouldn't it be fun, asks this individual, Robert Townsend writes, to see if we could start a new company dedicated to chicken salad. Chicken salad for the customer, for all the shareholders, and for the employees, most of whom will be shareholders, too. On the plane flying back to Florida from San Francisco, 
I did a pretty good skimming job on Mr. Dibble's book. And if you've tried with the idea of joining the drawn-faced, hollow, staring-eyed, trembling hands group known as entrepreneurs, who sometimes get very rich and sometimes work their you-know-what out for 40 years for less money than they could have made if they'd stayed with old ABC company in a 40-hour week, and who sometimes end up in bankruptcy, by all means buy and read Up Your Own Organization by Donald M. Dibble, published by Hawthorne Books. As the late Vince Lombardi once said of the forward pass in football, only four things can happen to a forward pass, and three of them are bad. Going into business for yourself is on the same order. But what would football be without the forward pass? And what would this country be without entrepreneurs? The definition of entrepreneur is one who assumes the risk and management of business, an enterpriser. And I read in Ethics, the International Journal of Social, Political, and Legal Philosophy, published by the University of Chicago Press, in an article, Kierkegaard, The Self and Ethical Existence, by George J. Stack of the State University of New York, a quotation of Kierkegaard that should make us all stop and think. He said, There is nothing of which every man is so afraid of as getting to know how enormously much he is capable of doing and becoming. There is nothing of which every man is so afraid of as getting to know how enormously much he is capable of doing and becoming. And then Stack writes, One can refuse to seek self-knowledge, can live an unexamined life, or can fall into moral indifference. But the life of such a being is not the life of a person, nor of an authentically existing individual. And again he wrote, Not to take up responsibility for oneself is to lose the possibility of being a self. And by coming to know the actual self as far as this is possible, one accepts responsibility for what one has been, and one is now capable of deliberate choice. Choice integrates the various aspects of the self, unifies and consolidates the diverse, often contradictory tendencies of the potential self. Well, that's a tremendous article. I wish we could give you the whole thing. If you write to the University of Chicago Press, I'm sure they can supply you with a copy, and I think you'd enjoy ethics as much as I do. In another place, Professor Stack writes, One of the most primitive forms of self-alienation is manifested when an individual does what they want him to do. They meaning significant others, dominant or influential others, even though it's something which he consciously does not want to do. Perhaps we should hit those points in order. First, it's by finding ourselves that we can come to know how enormously much we're really capable of doing and becoming. It is not by acting a part, trying to live like other people, living a second-hand and derivative life, that we come to know our real powers. It's by finding ourselves. It's by examining and exploring ourselves and taking full responsibility for ourselves. Not to take up responsibility for oneself, as Professor Steck writes, is to lose the possibility of being a self. And by coming to know the actual self as far as this is possible, one accepts responsibility for what one has been and one is now capable of deliberate choice. Choice integrates the various aspects of the self, unifies and consolidates the diverse, often contradictory tendencies of the potential self. And one of the most primitive forms of self-alienation, of cutting ourselves away from the real and powerful person we truly are, comes about when we do what they want us to do, even though it's something we consciously do not want to do. In another part of the article, Professor Stack writes about the importance of choice and says we do not deliberate about driving our car from one place to another, from our place of work to our home. We simply do it voluntarily. There are, however, specific moments when we're confronted with choices which we know will have important ramifications for our lives. A person may ask himself, should I pursue this career or that? Should I live in accordance with ethical categories or not? Should I marry or not? Should I serve in combat in time of war, or should I be a conscientious objector? Should I believe in the existence of God or not? There are some options which one encounters which are, as William James pointed out, momentous options for ourselves. And the important thing is to choose. Since this resoluteness is an affirmation of one's self, an expression of one's individuality, irresolution is either an incapacity to choose or an unwillingness to choose. What is lacking is serious or passionate concern. The great quotation by Emerson popped into my mind. He said, What a new face courage puts on everything. It's by having the courage to make the decisions that represent our real gut choices, to take responsibility for our decisions in our lives, that we will find our true powers. As Mumford writes, 
The great mass of comfortable, well-fed people of our civilization live lives of emotional apathy and mental torpor, lives of enfeebled desire, second-hand lives. And he said, the Greeks had a word for this pallid simulacrum of real existence. They called it Hades. I think it can be said that the great majority of people do not really live as we like to think of that word at all. They spend their lives as puppets with the strings in the hands of they. What they say, what they think, how they live. George Stack reminds us that Socrates held that it is by no means necessary that everyone become a man. And Kierkegaard held that it is by no means necessary or inevitable that one become a person or an integral self. The act of choosing is not only individuating, but it's an act whereby the individual both expresses and attains freedom. The primitive freedom an individual has is the freedom for possibility. Before William James, Kierkegaard insisted that only in the world in which there is possibility is freedom itself possible. And he writes, an individual who chooses himself ethically, chooses himself as this concrete individual who exists here and now, and whose present existence has been shaped by causal factors which he appropriates, that this, the individual, becomes conscious of himself as this definite person with these talents, these dispositions, these instincts, these passions, influenced by these definite surroundings as this definite product of a definite environment. But being conscious of himself in this way, he assumes responsibility for all this. Having freely chosen what has been, as it were, imposed upon him, the individual is now able to bear responsibility for what he does with these inherited dispositions, these psychological tendencies or characteristics. Freedom is not, as it was for Spinoza, the recognition of necessity, but it is manifested in and made possible by the appropriation of necessity and possibility. Human freedom is not given as such, except as a possibility that may be actualized. It is the finite freedom of a person who is shaped and influenced by some circumstances which are outside his power. Man is determined in his being, but determining in his becoming. Choosing oneself as determined as a condition for the possibility of realizing oneself as free for possibilities positive for oneself, and not to act on a possibility is to run the risk of losing that possibility as possibility. And I've long been of the opinion that trying to play it too safely is about the best way in the world to remove most of all possibility from our lives and end by missing the boat, by missing ourselves and our powers. Dr. Frederick S. Pearls agreed with this idea, too. His book, Gestalt Therapy Verbatim, is one of the most charming, educating, and refreshing books I've read in a long time. I've become a fan of Gestalt Therapy, and as he points out in the frontispiece, to suffer one's death and to be reborn is not easy. I think we do this when we shrug off the phony life imposed upon us by others and the environment as much as we can and take responsibility for ourselves and our future. The prayer in Gestalt Therapy is great. It goes like this. I do my thing and you do your thing. I am not in this world to live up to your expectations and you are not in this world to live up to mine. You are you and I am I. And if by chance we find each other, it's beautiful. If not, it can't be helped. The great Robert Louis Stevenson has long been one of my favorites, not just as a great writer, but as a man as well. Plagued by a frail body and poor health, destined to die at just 44 years of age, he put more living, more travel, and more work and talent into his short time here on Earth than a million so-called average men. The author of Treasure Island, Kidnapped, Dr. Jekyll, and Mr. Hyde, Stevenson once wrote in a small essay, As courage and intelligence are the two qualities best worth a good man's cultivation. That's good, isn't it? Courage and intelligence. So it is the first part of intelligence to recognize our precarious estate in life and the first part of courage to be not at all abashed before the fact. A frank and somewhat headlong carriage, not looking too anxiously before, not dallying in maudlin regret over the past, stamps the man who is well armored for this world, and not only well armored for himself, but a good friend and a good citizen to boot. We do not go to cowards for tender dealings. There is nothing so cruel as panic. The man who has least fear for his own carcass has most time to consider others. So soon as prudence has begun to show up in the brain like a dismal fungus, it finds its first expression in the paralysis of generous acts. 
The victim begins to shrink spiritually. He develops a fancy for parlors with a regulated temperature. The care of one important body and soul becomes so engrossing that all the noises of the outer world begin to come thin and faint into the parlor with the regulated temperature. He makes some important points in those few words, don't you think? The first and most important being that the two qualities best worth a good man or woman's cultivation are courage and intelligence, and that it's the first part of intelligence to recognize a very precarious estate in life and thus not play it too safely. There's no way to win that game. Tiptoeing through life won't change the final outcome as soon as too much prudence begins to show up in the brain like a dismal fungus. It finds its first expression in a paralysis of generous acts. The victim begins to shrink and so on. Some people worry so much about the future that they fail entirely to enjoy today. William Lyon Phelps once pointed out that we look backward too much and we look forward too much. Thus we miss the passing moment. In our regrets and apprehensions, we miss the only eternity of which man can be absolutely sure, the eternal present, for it is always now. The fear of life is the favorite disease of the 20th century. Too many people are afraid of tomorrow. Their happiness is poisoned by a phantom. Many are afraid of old age, forgetting that even if they should lose their bodily vigor, weakness itself may minister to the development of the mind and spirit. Instead of chagrin over the past and alarm over the future, suppose we consider our opportunity. As Emerson put it, write in on your heart that every day is the best day in the year. No man has earned anything rightly until he knows that every day is doomsday. Today is a king in disguise. A small lesson from three great minds, Stevenson, Phelps, and Emerson. Courage and intelligence are the two qualities best worth our cultivation, and don't play it too safe. The man who has least fear for his own carcass has most time to consider others. There's a little green paperback book entitled The Gospel of Emerson, put together by Newton Dillaway and published by Unity Books, Lee's Summit, Missouri. It's a book which, if you read it quietly and thoughtfully, will be a marvelous new piece in understanding. Emerson was one of the truly gifted intellectual giants of all time. He saw things with a wonderful clarity, through layers of the obvious and commonplace, to the kernel of truth that lay within. In reading the little book on Emerson, I came across this line hidden down at the end of a paragraph. People wish to be settled. Only as far as they are unsettled is there any hope for them. You know, that takes some thinking to understand, but it's one of those statements we know intuitively to be true. Even though we strive to become settled and seek the mirage of security, we know that we do our best, think our best, accomplish most, and most certainly live more fully when we're unsettled. As Emerson put it, only as far as they are unsettled is there any hope for them. In other words, few of us know what's good for us. There's a security of a kind available to each of us more than we require, really, but it's inside, not outside. It's to be found in the development of ourselves as creative, productive beings, loving and thinking persons. That real security is to be found. It cannot be outside of us. If we're not secure as persons, we will only stew and worry about any other sort of security of being settled. And so we usually strive hardest for a chimera, and that's what often brings so much disillusionment in later life, when people begin to sit around and stare at each other and wonder what they've been up to. Being settled is all right for cows and goldfish, I suppose, although I'm not at all sure about that. But being settled doesn't seem to work at all with human beings. They get nervous and querulous, start snapping at each other. They also get fat and sloppy and turn inward upon themselves and get unhappy expressions on their faces when they've been settled for very long. They find that the very thing for which they've striven for so long is not what they want at all. It's the fun of the journey, but usually in belated retrospect it really matters. It's while they're striving that they reach their heights. Only as far as they are unsettled is there any hope for them. How often a successful man hears his wife say, it was a lot more fun when we were living in a walk-up apartment and counting our pennies to make ends meet. We were happiest then. And the fact is that they probably were. But did they know it then? Living on the edge, striving toward goals still fairly distant, brings out the best or the very worst in people. If they're wise, it brings out the best. If they're ignorant, it can bring out the worst. But being settled... Having it made, as we say, seldom brings with it much enthusiasm. And Emerson also said, nothing great was ever achieved without enthusiasm. And we are most enthusiastic when we are as yet unsettled. There are many paradoxes in life, and one is that while people wish to be settled, it is only as far as they are unsettled that there's any hope for them. 
John Handy, president of Handy Associates, New York Consultants, has said that one out of every three middle managers could be fired with more gain than loss to his company. And that's especially true in larger companies, says Mr. Handy. Calling him every third middle manager, calling him the corporate parasite, Handy says he fits the following description. He never makes a meaningful decision that helps increase profits. He spouts cliches and bromides when confronted with a question or problem. His time schedule is vague. He's never presented with or always manages to avoid a task which demands measurable results. He constantly asks questions and seldom presents ideas. He's never under any real pressure to produce. He's a fence-sitter who skillfully manages always to wind up on the winning side. And when he's on vacation, things go just as smoothly without him. What about the manager of tomorrow? What will be required of him or her? What kind of person will he or she be? The Research Institute of America interviewed more than 100 company presidents to determine what makes today's manager a success, theorizing that this might reveal a key to the question. Four major qualities were repeatedly identified. The first was ability to manage. That includes not only the ability to get things done through others, but the ability to manage one's own affairs successfully. Two, fiscal responsibility. The most effective managers were adept not only at obtaining financial reports from their own operations, but were extremely resourceful at getting and interpreting financial reports from competitors. Three, involvement in the future. Many of the top people felt that middle management concerned itself too much with the present, under the assumption that the top brass should take care of the future. Yet alert middle managers are often in a better position to spot trends and opportunities before they come to the attention of top management. And four, professional competence. Knowledge becomes obsolete quickly today. An effective manager carries on a continuing program of self-education in his field. The management of business is often and quite aptly compared with the parent. So I suppose it can be said that the good parent will follow along much the same lines. Manage one's own affairs as well as get things done through others. Fiscal responsibility, handling finances wisely, making sure there's a profit left over at the bottom line at the end of the year. Involvement in the future, planning ahead, alert for opportunities. And professional competence, involving a never-ending program of self-education through study. And a good manager and parent says to those in his charge, you can become anything you seriously want to become. My job is to help you become it. That kind of statement has a double-barreled effect. First, it indicates that we should all be striving for something. And second, it indicates a willingness to help. Attached to the telephone of a young executive of my acquaintance is a small sign that reads... God give me the wisdom to be as smart as my customers. You know, there's a ton of good sense and worlds of growth opportunity lurking in that small, pithy comment. If there's one attitude common among those who serve the buying public, it's often an attitude which says, okay, dummy, what'll it be? It's an attitude which makes the mistake of assuming that because I work in this business, I know all there is to know about it while the customer doesn't know anything about it at all. Because of that situation, I am infinitely wise, while the customer I now see approaching is infinitely stupid. Now, I don't mean to say that all who serve the public feel that way by any means. A good percentage of them are great and a joy to do business with, and we remember them and go back to them whenever we can. And I don't mean to pick on the salespeople or the service people particularly. The boss is the one who frequently makes the mistake of underestimating the public or assumes most people are as dumb as he is. Some time back, I was checking into a motel, and soon I was back at the desk asking them to make reservations for me somewhere else. The girl asked me what was wrong, and I simply said, your motel isn't good enough. Traveling is tough enough without having to stay in a small, dirty room with an indifferent shower that goes from scalding hot one minute to ice cold the next with a tile and plaster falling off the walls and ceiling. They underestimate the customer, or feel they have a lock on business whether the customer likes it or not. The primary function of any organization is to help man enjoy a more meaningful existence. That little legend ought to be cast in bronze and put every place in a business firm. The primary function of any organization is to help man enjoy a more meaningful existence. Now, if it isn't meeting that qualification, the people in it should get into something else, should give some thought to going straight. The definition of genius is to think in unhabitual ways. A day should never pass in which people in business do not ask themselves, how can we do a better job of serving our customers? But the number of businessmen who ask themselves that question every day, you could fit easily into the back seat of a Volkswagen. Instead of concentrating on the cash register, if they would concentrate more on serving the customer, the cash register would take care of itself. We shouldn't get our causes and effects mixed up. 
by making our product or service right, all else will fall into place. It's just a matter of time and perseverance. But we should never underestimate the customer and his natural desire for quality, for value for his time and money. The business people who have heeded that kind of thinking have prospered. Anyway, it's a good idea, that little sign. God give me the wisdom to be as smart as my customers. And we might add, and to serve them as I enjoy being served when positions are reversed. And that business of thinking in unhabitual ways can also bring a fresh, clean breath of renewal into a business. Imagination, you know, is everything. Wilfred A. Peterson, author of The Art of Living in the World Today, writing in Science of Mind magazine some time back, quoted Felix Adler, who once said, I am grateful for the idea that has used me. And Peterson went on to say, there are millions of great ideas in the world waiting for men and women to use them. For people to dedicate their minds, hearts, spirits, eyes, ears, hands, arms, and legs to putting those ideas into action. There's no lack of ideas waiting to be used. There's only a lack of people willing to use them. The idea of the electric light used Edison. The idea of flying the Atlantic used Lindbergh. The idea of saving the Union used Lincoln. The idea of building a hospital in Africa used Schweitzer. The idea of writing Uncle Tom's Cabin used Harriet Beecher Stowe. Ideas use men when men work for those ideas, when men are dominated by those ideas and make them a part of themselves. The ideas need not be world-shaking. Ideas may be limited and yet meaningful. The idea of a new school in the community, the idea of a new church, there are ideas for thousands of projects that will contribute in large or small measure to mankind. Ideas of themselves do nothing. Used by men, they can do anything. The idea of peace is a great idea, perhaps the very greatest, that men should open themselves to and be used by. The idea of war has been used by man for far too long a time. It sent millions marching to their deaths, destroyed cities, wrecked the world. We need to be gripped by the idea of peace. We should get it into our hearts, into our bloodstreams, into our bones, and make it a part of ourselves. It's been waiting around for a long time for men to use. The supply of great ideas is inexhaustible. Let a great idea use you. Stand up for it, work for it, teach it, sell it, crusade for it. Help a great idea to become a reality through you. Well, I think that's a great little piece, because it should make clear to those who are searching for something to do, some kind of work to get into, a way in which they can not only find something to do, but at the same time be swept up and along by an idea that's bigger than they are. Find an idea you think is interesting and exciting and jump into it with both feet, head, hands, and heart. Let a great idea use you. A great idea might be to build and operate the best business of its kind. Marshall Field had that idea. Great restaurants, hardware stores, supermarkets, any sort of business. You don't have to make a great invention or win the Nobel Peace Prize. A business motivated by a great idea will succeed out of all proportion to a business operating only for profit. So will a career in anything. Selling, law, medicine, farming. A person moved by an idea that's bigger than he is can move a lot of mountains during his lifetime. A great idea is like a, like a broad, swift river. Once you've found the one you want, all you have to do is jump in and start swimming. It'll carry you along much faster than you could have traveled otherwise. In the world of today, it seems that each of us needs to choose between one of three courses. Recognizing that we are undergoing changes unprecedented in human history, we can choose to escape from the world, to help build a better world, or to just hang on for dear life and hope that the whole thing doesn't fly apart during our lifetimes. Now, how about you? Which course are you taking? Sometimes I think it's possible to escape and help in the reconstruction. In Lewis Mumford's book, The Story of Utopias, he talks about some of these things. It isn't that things are necessarily bad now. Much is very good. Much is almost too good, it seems, for people who have not learned to cope with success. But nothing or very little is as it was. We're in a whole new ball game, and it takes some shifting of gears. we found, for example, that affluence does not satisfy once. It simply creates new ones, more voracious, more difficult to satisfy than the old ones. Utopia involves the satisfaction of once, as Mumford points out, but the wants of man are insatiable. Supply one, and two rise to take its place. And man is the only creature so constituted. Satisfy the wants of an animal, and he'll drop off into a peaceful sleep, totally content. Not man. Satisfy man's wants, and his eyes bug out looking for new ones. That's one of the reasons there's no end in sight to the possible growth of business, which is, in many ways, good. The same technology that created the monsters which terrify us now over population, pollution, wars, and crime can, can contain them. Ultimately, do away with them entirely, I'm sure. Technology gives us what we want. And then it lets us see, as a New York University professor put it, 
that while dissatisfaction may be uncomfortable, the real disasters in life come from getting what we want. But only temporarily, during man's painful maturing process. Of the three choices open to us, escape, reconstruction, or teeth gritting and hanging on, I think most of us want to help put things together in a better way. And one way each of us can do that is to strive for quality in whatever it is we do. Simplify our lives. Cut down on the number of things we'll permit to engage our attention and make sure they're of good quality. When you're building on quality, you're building on long-term growth. If we refuse to let junk appear in our lives, it will disappear from our lives. If we refuse to buy things we think are priced too high, the prices will come down. We can make do with what we've got. If the homes in the new development all look exactly alike and there are no trees, let's don't buy one. And let's don't buy anything that has not been well constructed to last a long time. Let's carefully examine and check out things before we'll permit them to enter our lives. And most importantly of all, let's make sure that what we do is of the best quality possible. The late Pearl Buck, famed author of The Good Earth and Nobel Prize winner, wrote something for Modern Maturity magazine some time back, which was reprinted in Science of Mind, that all people, I think, might do well to read. Let me quote just a bit of it. She wrote, Life is a continuing process. This much I'm sure of, and this much I state on a fine sunny morning as I reflect upon the fact that I've begun to live the 80th year of my life. It's an enjoyable year. I'm in good health, I have much work to do, and I enjoy myself in what I do. I sit in a comfortable room. My work table faces a window, which gives me a charming view of a country road winding up a hill. It's the main street of a small village, Denby, in the state of Vermont. We've been coming to Vermont, my family and I, for some 20 years to spend summers, to celebrate Christmas, to enjoy skiing. Now the children have married and gone their way. Their father has preceded me into the next stage of life, whatever it is. And so I'm alone, and yet never alone. Around me is the village life. Here in my house is the life I find in books, in music, and above all, in work. I do not know what people mean when they speak of being old. I do not know because I do not know where life begins, if indeed there is a beginning. And I don't know where it ends, if indeed there is an end. I know that I'm in a stage, a phase, a period of life. I enter this stage at birth. I shall end this stage with death. For me, death is merely the entrance into further existence. I do not know what this existence will be, but then I did not know what existence in this stage would be when I was born into it. I did not ask to be, but I have been and I am, and my reason tells me I shall continue to be. I am on my way somewhere, just as I was on the day of my birth. Young and old are for me meaningless words, except as we use them to denote where we are in the process of this stage of being. Would I wish to be young again? No for I've learned too much to wish to lose it. I have reached an honorable position in life because I am old and no longer young. I'm far more valuable person today than I was 50 years ago or 40 years ago or 30, 20, or even 10. I've learned so much since I was 70. I believe I can honestly say that I've learned more in the last 10 years than I learned in any previous decade. This, I suppose, is because I've perfected my techniques so that I no longer waste time in learning how to do what I have to do which is what I also want to do. There will be those who question my certainty of a continuing existence. My belief is based upon sound scientific reasons and long acquaintance with some of the greatest scientists and philosophers of our times. Religious faith and scientific hypotheses are much nearer to the same conclusions than is commonly realized. Serious studies in parapsychology are being conducted in various countries, and the results are remarkable and will someday be made known. Let us take thought. Let us reflect. We who have spent our years, let us see what can be done in the remaining years. This from a distinguished writer and thinker as she moved into her 80th year, the Nobel Prize winning author. She also commented, imagine that she had learned more in the decade from her 70th birthday to her 80th than in any previous time of her life. As to her belief in the continuation of life, she wrote, for the present, I content myself with two true anecdotes which express in simple terms the silence between this life and next. The first occurred in my own family soon after the death of my husband, who was much loved by his grandchildren, Susan, then age five, and Ricky, age three. The occasion was a family picnic, and I overheard the following conversation. Ricky, why doesn't grandfather come to the picnic? Susan, he can't come because he's up in heaven. Ricky, why doesn't he come down? Susan, he can't find the ladder. 
It's truly spoken, Pearl Buck wrote, out of the mouth of a babe. He does not come down because he can't find the ladder. The techniques of communication are just not complete. The second anecdote was given me through a letter by an unknown woman. In effect, it was as follows. When my small children could not understand the silence between their recently dead father and us, who loved him so dearly, I explained by describing to them the life cycle of the dragonfly. It begins as a grub in water. Then at the proper moment, it surfaces, finds it has wings, and flies away. I suppose I told them that the ones left in the water wonder where he went and why he doesn't come back. But he can't, because he has wings. Nor can they go to him, because they don't have wings yet. Something like that is true, I believe, Pearl Buck wrote. Something like that is true. We haven't our wings yet either, but someday... I remember reading something she wrote many years ago when she compared the fear of death with the fear of leaving the womb into life. The late Ernest Holmes wrote something we do well to remember every morning as we begin our day. He said, Create or perish is the eternal mandate of nature. Be constructive or become frustrated is an equal demand. We do not all have to act or think alike, but each should give full rein to the urge within him to express his life. This thing called life is intimate to everyone, even as the law of cause and effect is available to all. Take your place, then, in the universe in which you live, having neither fear nor arrogance, but in the simplicity of faith come to believe that you are one with the creative genius back of this vast array of ceaseless motion, this original flow of life. You are as much a part of it as the sun, the earth, and the air. There's something in you telling you this, like a voice echoing from some mountain top of inward vision, like a light whose origin no man has seen, like an impulse welling up from an invisible source. Your mind is an outlet through which the creative intelligence of the universe seeks fulfillment. It's good, isn't it? And powerful. It reminds me of Emerson's great quote that we should listen to the voice within. Create or perish, be constructive or become frustrated. We may dread the work that lies ahead of us tomorrow, but we should dread even more a time when we will have nothing at all to do tomorrow, when there's nothing for us to do. And so, let's create. Let's bring something new, something better because of us, to our work, which is what creation is all about. There are all kinds of people in the world. There are the bizarre, the decadent, the bored, the disenchanted. There are the mindless hedonists, the shallow seekers of distraction. There are the glib cynics to whom nothing is or can be good or meaningful. But the happiest people on earth are those who, out of themselves, create conditions beneficial to those it has been given them to serve. They create happy homes, good meals, education, better health, enjoyment, humor, new buildings, products, services, a better job, a helping hand, better government. Wherever they are, things are better for their having been born. They bring something of themselves to their work, something that makes it better. They are constructive. They are the builders of the world. They listen to the iron string that vibrates deep within them, of which Emerson spoke. Ernest Holmes went on to say, The greatest gift life could have made to you is yourself. You are a spontaneous, self-choosing center in life, and the great drama of being, the great joy of becoming, the certainty of eternal expansion. You could not ask for more, and more could not have been given. You need not mold your life after another. Trust yourself. Believe in your direct relationship with life, and you will not be disappointed. But do not wait. Today is the time to start. Right where you are is the place to begin. Thank you. In an early direct line, we talked about the dilemma faced by most human beings in our kind of society, which is the matter of making decisions. We've learned that ours is the only species on Earth whose natural state is one of disorientation, and therefore each of us must create his own world, even if the creation of our world consists in nothing more than playing copycat, closing our eyes and ears and just blindly following the person in front of us, hoping that somehow he or the person he's following knows where he's going and that when we get there, we'll both like it. We like to think that we're intelligent and perhaps even bold decision-makers, but the facts seem to indicate that we're not and that we use all kinds of dodges to keep from making decisions. In reading a back issue of Psychology Today, April 1973, I learned of a book which I immediately ordered, written by Princeton philosopher Walter Kaufman, entitled, With Guilt and Justice, From Decidophobia to Autonomy. Now, in this book, with a long title, 
obviously the result of many years of thoughtful study and research and a lot of independent thinking, Kaufman lists and explains ten major cop-outs most of us use to keep from making decisions, and which makes us decidophobes. Decidophobia is simply the fear of making decisions. He misses the most common form of this malady, which robs us of our freedom and opportunity, plain everyday drifting. We go through the motions day after day. We get up, get dressed, go to work, on the job and off. We simply let the tide take us as it has in the past. Kaufman calls that type A drifting. Type B drifting is a fooler. It's the kind of drifting people do who pretend they don't belong to type A. He, the uh, type B drifter, tries to give the impression that he is in revolt against the so-called status quo that he sees about him on every side, and he drops out of life. He lives from moment to moment, day to day, letting chance decide the direction of his life. Now, this is simply another form of drifting, another cop-out, another way of avoiding the agony of making meaningful, faithful decisions. This type conforms as rigidly to his group of failures in his dress or lack of it, his hair, his walk, his talk, his attitudes, as the type A drifter conforms to his. The whole thing is a studied and thus tense acting job, all for the sake of avoiding decisions and taking charge of one's own life. He goes on to point out that religion has for centuries been mankind's number one strategy for avoiding decisions. We don't even have to decide which of the many religions and sects to choose. Our parents usually make the choice for us, just as their parents made the choice for them. We are confirmed in that faith at an early age, long before we have anything even approaching the powers of intelligent choice, and we simply grow up in it. Now we have all the shall-nots and shalls we need, and every week we have an official of our faith to tell us what we should be doing and how we should be living our lives. Now, this is not always the case, of course. Many people have chosen their own religions for important reasons and have found meaning and satisfaction in doing so. But the great multitude simply moves up another notch on the generation bracket, just as it does with its political party and other prejudices. After religion comes the type A and type B drifters that I mentioned. Incidentally, it seems that in order to be a drifter, many people require a regular supply of alcohol, drugs, or tranquilizers to keep their minds below the threshold of the window through which they might get a clear view of themselves and their meaningless lives. Kaufman refers to these people as being inauthentic. And it seems that when just plain drifting brings about a feeling of hopelessness, this type will join a movement of some kind. When a person lacks identity within himself, he will often strive to find it in an organization of some sort which will take over the decision-making role. But do as I have done. Order the book and read it. It will give you a much clearer insight into your decisions of the past, and you'll recall that it's by examining our decisions that we can come to know ourselves. What we're seeking, as Professor Kaufman of Princeton points out, is autonomy. Authenticity as sovereign persons. An autonomous person avoids all ten strategies. He does not treat his own conclusions and decisions as authoritative or necessarily best, but chooses with his eyes open and then keeps them open, Kaufman says. He has the courage to admit that he may be wrong even about matters of the greatest importance. He objects to the ten strategies in the book, not on account of their supposed psychological origins, but because they preclude uninhibited self-criticism. Now, there are some well-known people who've resisted all ten strategies and lived autonomous lives. The most outstanding examples from the long history of Western philosophy are Socrates and Nietzsche. And Kaufman cites as a perfect modern example of the completely autonomous person, one who exhibits the most awesome courage, Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Rarely has it been so difficult for any man to stand alone, utterly alone, without any prop of any kind. His great books, The First Circle, Cancer Ward, Solzhenitsyn, a documentary record in August 1914, show how he succeeded in resisting all ten temptations, making one fateful decision after another against seemingly insuperable odds. His life is autonomy in action. I have read Solzhenitsyn's books, and I consider them to be among the most important in my library, and I recommend them to you. How does one go about making decisions on his own, decisions calculated to bring him face to face with the best possible life for him? He goes by his gut feelings. He listens to the voice within, and he knows Thoreau was right when he said, if one advances confidently in the direction of his dreams and endeavors to live the life which he has imagined, he will meet with a success unexpected in common hours. It's the decision to live my life, not necessarily the lives of those I see about me. In Man and People, Ortega says that each one of us is always in danger of not being the unique and untransferable self which he is. The majority of men, he wrote, perpetually betray this self which is waiting to be. 
And to tell the whole truth, our personal individuality as a personage which is never completely realized, a stimulating utopia, a secret legend which each of us guards in the depths of his heart. It is thoroughly comprehensible that Pindar summarizes his heroic ethics in the well-known imperative, Become what you are. Become what you are. That perhaps sums it up best, and this kind of thinking runs counter to the kindergarten philosophy of most people that the purpose of life is to be happy. Happiness is to life what a paint job is to a product. It's the glistening veneer and nothing more. What counts is the product itself, its quality, the depth, the truth of its design and purpose. My good friend Norman Guess of the Dartnell Company reminded me of a quotation from Alex Munth's novel, The Story of San Michel. It was published back in 1929 and was the book that started the vogue and success of the many doctor books, movies, soap operas, and television programs since. But in it, there appears this line. A man can stand a lot as long as he can stand himself. He can live without hope, without books, without friends, without music, as long as he can listen to his own thoughts. As long as he can listen to his own thoughts. And it's on those thoughts that we should act. There is often pain in that, the birth pains of new birth, and perhaps an occasional sensation of falling, of being unsupported. It means not sitting and wallowing in our old beliefs, but moving out of them into new, fresh territory. It means asking the question, am I living by my standards or by the standards of those about me? And are they living by their own standards or the standards of those about them? It's possible that we've all been wrong. Soren Kierkegaard wrote, The greatest danger, that of losing one's own self, may pass off quietly as if it were nothing. Every other loss, that of an arm, a leg, five dollars, and so forth, is sure to be noticed. That was written more than a hundred years ago. The whole idea is to become a winner as opposed to becoming a loser. But just who is a winner, and what do we mean by losing? There's a marvelous little paperback titled Born to Win by James and Youngward, or Jungward, former students of Dr. Eric Byrne of transactional analysis fame. You probably read his book, Games People Play. But they've got a very good definition of what we mean by winners and losers. They point out that each human being is born as something new, something that never existed before. He's born with what he needs to win at life. Each person in his own way can see, hear, touch, taste, and think for himself. Each has his own unique potentials, his capabilities and limitations. Each can be a significant, thinking, aware, and creatively productive person in his own right, a winner. When we refer to a person as a winner, we do not mean one who beats the other guy by winning over him and making him lose. To us, a winner is one who responds authentically by being credible, trustworthy, responsive, and genuine, both as an individual and as a member of society, they write. A loser is one who fails to respond authentically. Few people are 100% winners or 100% losers. It's a matter of degree. However, once a person is on the road to being a winner, his chances are greater for becoming even more so. Winners have different potentials. Achievement is not the most important thing. Authenticity is. The authentic person experiences the reality of himself by knowing himself, being himself, and becoming a credible, responsive person. He actualizes his own unprecedented uniqueness and appreciates the uniqueness of others. They go on to write, He does not dedicate his life to a concept of what he imagines he should be. Rather, he is himself. And as such, he does not use his energy putting on a performance, maintaining pretense, and manipulating others into his games. A winner can reveal himself instead of projecting images that please, provoke, or entice others. He's aware that there's a difference between being loving and acting loving, between being stupid and acting stupid, between being knowledgeable and acting knowledgeable. He does not need to hide behind a mask. He throws off unrealistic self-images of inferiority or superiority. Autonomy does not frighten a winner. Autonomy does not frighten a winner. It does not frighten a Solzhenitsyn, a Socrates. The ridiculous Watergate affair which exposed to Americans and the world the venal inner workings of politics would never have happened in the first place if a few insiders had had the guts to stand up and act like winners. In the book Born to Win, it's pointed out that everyone has moments of autonomy, if only fleeting. 
However, a winner is able to sustain his autonomy over ever-increasing periods of time. He may lose ground occasionally. He may even fail. Yet in spite of setbacks, a winner maintains a basic faith in himself. A winner is not afraid to do his own thinking and to use his own knowledge. He can separate facts from opinion and doesn't pretend to have all the answers. He listens to others, evaluates what they say, but comes to his own conclusions. And while he can admire and respect other people, he's not totally defined, demolished, bound, or awed by them. A winner does not play helpless, nor does he play the blaming game. Instead, he assumes responsibility for his own life. He does not give others a false authority over him. He's his own boss and knows it. A winner's timing is right. He responds appropriately to the situation. His response is appropriate when it is related to the message sent and preserves the significance, worth, well-being, and dignity of the people involved. He knows that for everything there is a season, and for every activity a time. A time to be aggressive, and a time to be passive. A time to be together, and a time to be alone. A time to fight, and a time to love. A time to work, and a time to play. A time to cry, and a time to laugh. A time to confront, and a time to withdraw. A time to speak, and a time to be silent. A time to hurry, and a time to wait. In describing losers, James and John would write, Although people are born to win, they're also born helpless and totally dependent on their environment. Winners successfully make the transition from total helplessness to independence and then to interdependence. Losers do not. Somewhere along the line, they begin to avoid becoming self-responsible. Their winning or losing is influenced by what happens to them in childhood. A lack of response to dependency needs, poor nutrition, brutality, unhappy relationships, disease, continuing disappointment, inadequate physical care, and traumatic events are among the many experiences that contribute to making people losers. Such experiences interrupt deter or prevent the normal progress toward autonomy and self-actualization. To cope with negative experiences, a child learns to manipulate himself and others. And these manipulative techniques are hard to give up later in life and often become set patterns. A winner works to shed them. A loser hangs on to them. Some losers speak of themselves as successful but anxious, successful but trapped, or successful but unhappy. Others speak of themselves as totally beaten, without purpose, unable to move, half dead, or bored to death. A loser may not recognize that, for the most part, he's been building his own cage and digging his own grave, and is a bore to himself. A loser seldom lives in the present. He destroys the present by occupying his mind with past memories or future expectations. When the loser lives in the past, he dwells on the good old days or his past misfortunes. Nostalgically, he either clings to the way things used to be or bemoans his bad luck. He feels sorry for himself and shifts the responsibility for his unsatisfactory life onto others. Blaming others and excusing himself are often part of his games. A loser who lives in the past may lament, If only, if only I had married someone else, if only I had a different job, if only I had finished school, if only I had been handsome or beautiful. If only my spouse had stopped drinking. If only I'd been born rich. If only I'd had better parents. They go on to describe other characteristics of the loser, such as trying to live in the future or worrying about future catastrophes. It's a book worth getting and adding to your library. I think every member of your family will enjoy reading it. It helps determine whether we're among the winners or losers. And more importantly, what to do if we find ourselves in the wrong camp. The key word in our thinking and our conduct, in our goals... And in our lives is authenticity. We need to become what we are. I imagine the teachers get sick to death of hearing people tell them how to educate their charges. Everybody on earth seems to be a self-styled expert on just about everything under the sun, including that most difficult and certainly most important calling, teaching. I'm one of them, and I confess that I don't know anything about teaching. But we're looking for answers, and that's the important thing. Socrates said that the important thing is to learn how best to live our lives. I'll buy that. But how does one teach others how they can best live their lives? He can't. It's none of his affair. But more than that, he cannot tell another person how best to live his life any more than anyone can tell him how best to live his. 
But some things can be taught. They can be taught so that the person at the other end becomes so emotionally involved, so moved by what he's learning, that he realizes that what he has learned can be applied to his own life in the pursuit of the goals that are important to him. Now, trying to tell someone else how to live his life is like telling children that they must add the numbers 10 and 9 and keep adding just those two numbers so that they can keep getting the number 19 as a result. It's ridiculous. Instead, we teach them how to add so that they can then add any numbers that are important to what they happen to be doing. We teach them to read so that they can read anything they desire to read. But we often don't do the best job of telling them why it's so important that they become skilled in these exercises, why it's so important to a good life, a successful life. If we teach principles and explain why it is important that we understand those principles, what understanding them can mean in our lives and the lives of those dear to us, we teach at the same time a love of learning that will remain with a person all the years of his life. If we teach a person how to successfully sell a hammer, he can successfully sell anything. It's the principles of selling he learns. The product or service can be whatever he wants it to be. And his drive, the intensity he brings to his work, will be regulated by his goals, sometimes strong, sometimes weak, depending on what's going on in his life, and on whether or not he understands that he can reach the goals he establishes for himself and those he loves. Poor motivation almost always results from confusion as to what a person wants and or self-doubt as to his capacity to really accomplish his dreams. It's difficult for a child raised in a ghetto who has spent 15 years or more living with failure on every side of him to really believe that he can have anything he can qualify for. It's hard for him to understand that even though his father and mother and aunts and uncles and neighbors have all failed, he can succeed. He can have what he wants in life. But if he learns the principles that are involved and understands that if they'll work for little things, they'll also work for big things, it can revolutionize his life. I found the answer to a problem that's been plaguing me for years. During the past century, knowledge has multiplied a thousand times faster than during all the preceding ages of man. And knowing that to be a fact, I couldn't figure out why people didn't seem to get any smarter. Why the 20th century, with all its wonderful breakthroughs in all fields of human knowledge, has been one of the most barbaric in man's history. Well, in his excellent book, Some Lessons in Metaphysics, Jose Ortega y Gasset reminds us that man by himself would never be a student, just as man by himself would never be a taxpayer. He must pay taxes. He has to study. But he is, by nature, neither a taxpayer nor a student. To be a student or a taxpayer is an artificial state in which man finds himself by obligation, so people will learn no more than they absolutely must, which isn't much. Now, meanwhile, generation after generation, a frightening mass of human knowledge which the student must assimilate piles up, and in proportion, as knowledge grows, is enriched and becomes specialized, the student will move farther and farther away from feeling any immediate and genuine need for it. Each time there will be less congruence between the sad human activity which is studying and the admirable human occupation which is true knowing. And so the terrible gap, which began at least a century ago, continues to grow, the gap between living culture, genuine knowledge, and the ordinary man. Culture, or knowledge, has no other reality than to respond to needs that are truly felt and to satisfy them in one way or another. But the way of transmitting knowledge is to study, which is not to feel those needs. Therefore, culture or knowledge hangs in midair and has no roots of sincerity in the average man. Now, this culture, which does not have any root structure in man, a culture which does not spring from him spontaneously, lacks any native and indigenous values. Now, this is something imposed. It's extrinsic, strange, foreign, and unintelligible. In short, it's unreal. Underneath this culture, received but not truly assimilated, man will remain intact as he was. That is to say, he will remain uncultured, a barbarian. Now, when the process of knowing was shorter, more elemental, and more organic, it came closer to being felt by the common man who then assimilated it, recreated it, and revitalized it within himself. This explains the colossal paradox of these decades, that an enormous progress in terms of culture should have produced a man of the type we now have, a man indisputably more barbarous than was the man of a hundred years ago, and that this acculturation, this accumulation of culture, should produce 
paradoxically but automatically, humanity's return to barbarism. To say the problem might be solved by not studying at all would not be to solve the problem, but to ignore it. If a whole generation should cease to study, nine-tenths of the human race then alive would die a violent death. To solve the problem will take a deep reform of study and the student. In order to achieve this, one must turn teaching completely around. Primarily and fundamentally, teaching must be the teaching of a need for the science and not the teaching of the science itself, whose need the student doesn't feel. But that's why we don't get smarter. I have an interesting uh, question for you here. What is life? This might be a question you'd like to bring up at the dinner table with the kids. What is life? Do you have a pretty good answer? There is a good one, and it was given to us by the same Jose Ortega y Gasset. It appears in his book, Some Lessons in Metaphysics, which we recommend. That's a book I think every thinking person should read 10 or 15 times, and I know you'll enjoy it. He wrote, What then is life? Do not search far afield. Do not try to recall learned expressions of wisdom. The fundamental truths must be always at hand, for only thus are they fundamental. Those that one must go forth to seek are the ones that are found only in a single place, the particular localized provincial truths, the truths in a corner, not the basic ones. Life is what we are and what we do. It is, then, of all things, the closest to each one of us. Put a hand on it, and it will let itself be grasped like a tame bird. You can read for twenty years and not come up with something as true and basic and marvelous as that. Life is what we are and what we do. Life is what we do and what happens to us. Life is always a now, and it consists of what now is. The past and the future of your life have reality only in the now, and this is thanks to the fact that you now remember your past or anticipate your future. And in this sense, life is pure actuality. It is punctual, a point in the present, which contains all our past and all our future. And then Gasset would say to his students at the University of Madrid, the purpose of these lessons is no other than to incite each of you to take care of your life, for you have only one, and that one is composed of a given number, a very limited number, of instants, of nows. To use that number badly is to destroy it, to kill a bit of your life. Nothing of what we do would be our life if we did not take account of it. Living is that strange, unique reality which has the privilege of existing for its own sake, all living is one's own living, feeling oneself live, knowing oneself to be existing, where knowing does not imply intellectual knowledge or any special wisdom, but is that surprising presence which one's life has for every one of us. Without that knowing, without that awareness, an aching tooth would not hurt us. The stone does not feel itself, nor does it know itself to be a stone. Toward itself, as toward everything else, it is totally blind. Living, on the other hand, is a revelation, a refusal to content oneself with being unless one sees or understands what one is, a become acquainted with oneself. It is the incessant discovery that we make of ourselves and of the world around us. In its very root and heart, living consists in knowing and understanding ourselves, in noticing ourselves and what surrounds us, in being transparent to ourselves. Life is what we do. Life is what we do because life is knowing what we are doing. It is, in short, finding ourselves in the world and occupied with the things and the beings of the world. And here's another question you might want to pop on your family at dinner or a friend at lunch. In the billions of years since the Earth's formation, what was the most important thing that ever happened on Earth? I got to thinking about this at lunch the other day. And I think it makes for an interesting topic. What's the most important thing that ever happened on the planet Earth? Do you know? Well, if you think about it for a few minutes, you realize that it was the appearance of man. If it hadn't been for him, no one would ever have known the Earth existed. But we still don't know if the appearance of man was good or bad. Good or bad, that is, from the standpoint of the billions of other creatures on the planet. About 9,000 years ago, man began his first rudimentary civilization with the planting of crops and the domestication of animals. 
And in all the centuries since that time, he's been growing progressively worse, as far as being a neighbor is concerned, worse to all other living things, including himself. In the Pogo comic strip, one of the characters said, We have met the enemy, and he is us. But it wasn't until the 20th century that man really showed what he was capable of. With the Industrial Revolution and burgeoning technology, man was able to outdo even himself, with the result that ours has been the bloodiest century in the history of man. Following the communist takeovers in Russia and China and the other countries they've managed to corral into their imperialistic sphere, millions upon millions of men, women, and children have been killed. It's been estimated that six million were killed in Russia alone. No one knows how many were slaughtered in China. This was after the Japanese did a pretty good job there themselves. Then came World War II. I'm not mentioning World War I. We were still learning then. In addition to the millions who died as combatants, many more millions of innocent civilians were slaughtered under Hitler in Nazi Germany, perhaps eight million, maybe more. Since the dawn of this century, and it came in so softly, so quietly, there has been more pure, unadulterated mayhem and slaughter than in any former ten centuries put together, capped with our own invention of the atomic bomb, which was designed, built, and dropped for the specific purpose of wiping out entire cities the way you wipe out an anthill. Overkill. Men, women, little children, the sick and the pregnant, the blind, the helpless. Kill them all. The ultimate weapon was finally invented, and the means to deliver it to any spot on the face of the earth in minutes. Of course, it's undergone a whole lot of improvement since 1945. We've got thermonuclear devices now that can wipe out an entire country. In fact, we're approaching the point now where we have more missiles than targets. One missile, the MIRV, can incinerate in an instant millions of civilians in a whole collection of towns and cities, and the century still has a few years to go. I wonder what the 21st century will be like, because all we've proved in 9,000 years is that we keep getting more efficient at killing each other. You might pop that question to your family or your friends at lunch. What was the most important thing that ever happened on the face of the earth? Well, it was the appearance of man. Next question, was it good or bad? From the evidence so far, there's really only one answer to that. In an excellent article for Red Book magazine some time back, a Dr. Sidney M. Girard, professor of psychology at the University of Florida, and the well-known artist Whitman collaborated on an article entitled The Fear That Cheats Us of Love. Now, they point out that if we want to be loved, we must disclose ourselves. We must disclose ourselves to the other person. If we want to love someone, he must permit us to know him. Now, this would seem obvious, yet most of us spend a great part of our lives hiding our true selves and our true feelings from the other person. Now, why is this so? Well, for a great variety of reasons, some obvious, some not, some sensible, some profoundly harmful. But the most important reason springs from the very nature of the human enterprise itself. Paradoxically, we fail to disclose ourselves to other people because we want so much to be loved. By failing to disclose ourselves, we make that love difficult, if not impossible. Children don't know their parents. Parents don't know their children. Husbands and wives are often strangers to each other. One has only to think of the astronomical rate of divorce and of the contemporary conflict between parent and children. One has only to hear the anxiety and pain expressed in the therapist's office when these closest of all relationships are touched upon, to know that it's possible to be involved in a family for years, playing one's role nicely and never getting to know the other members of the family who are also playing roles. It seems that much of human life is best described as impersonation. We are role players, every one of us. We say that we feel things we don't feel. We say that we did things we did not do. We say that we believe things that we do not believe. We pretend that we're loving when we're full of hostility. We pretend that we're calm and indifferent when we actually are trembling with anxiety and fear. We not only conceal ourselves, we also usually assume that the other person is in hiding. We're wary of him because we take it for granted that he, too, will frequently misrepresent his real feelings, his intentions, or his past, since we so often are guilty of doing these very things ourselves. Another reason we hide is to protect ourselves from change. Change is frightening to most people. A young bride returns from her honeymoon, still lost in the romantic haze of being in love, blissfully happy and convinced that that's the way it's always going to be. One day her husband comes home, troubled over some problem at work, and broods in silence or snaps at her irritably. 
she in turn finds that getting meals and cleaning house, even when they're done for her husband, aren't all that satisfying. Her feelings are changing. But instead of facing the fact that nothing in life stands still, she tries to pretend to herself and to her husband that she feels exactly as she did before. We try to remain constant, to freeze time, and time won't be frozen. And we don't want the other person to change either. The answer? Relax and level with each other. Without self-disclosure, real, long-range love is impossible. By opening ourselves up, we find the other person will do the same, and love has a chance. Self-disclosure is as important a part of growing as it is of love, and growth is a part of change. The real self is continually evolving. One's needs, wishes, feelings, values, goals, and behavior all change with age and experience. The answer? Disclose ourselves to those we love. Harvey Mindus, a practicing psychologist and a professor at UCLA, is the author of a marvelous book entitled Laughter and Liberation, in which he points out that everyone seems to realize the importance of a sense of humor and agrees that it's one of our most valuable faculties. Thinkers, simple and profound, declare that the ability to see the funny side of things and to laugh at ourselves and our troubles is an asset of the greatest magnitude. It can help us contend with adversity, derive greater joy out of living and maintain our sanity, yet no one seems to know how to cultivate it. The kind of humor that deserves to be called therapeutic is not the kind that enjoys jokes and comic routines. For delightful as they may be, they are contrived and superficial, bearing about the same relation to therapeutic humor as pretty pictures do to real art. The kind of sense of humor that can help us maintain our sanity moves beyond jokes, beyond wit, beyond laughter itself. It must constitute a frame of mind, a point of view, a deep-going, far-reaching attitude to life. A cluster of qualities characterizes this peculiar frame of mind, and here some of them are. Flexibility. In this case, a person's willingness to examine every side of every issue and every side of every side. Spontaneity. His ability to leap from one mood or mode of thought to another. Unconventionality. His freedom from the values of his time, his place, and his profession. Shrewdness. His refusal to believe that anyone, least of all himself, is what he seems to be. Playfulness. His grasp of life as a game, a tragic comic game that nobody wins, but that does not have to be won to be enjoyed. And humility. That elusive quality exemplified by the rabbi in this traditional story. A wise old rabbi lay dying, so his disciples lined up next to his deathbed to catch his final words. They arranged themselves in order from the most brilliant pupil to the most obtuse. The brilliant one bent over the prostrate form and whispered, Rabbi, what are your final words? My final words, murmured the ancient rabbi, are, Life is a river. The disciple passed it on to the person next to him, and the phrase traveled like wildfire down the line. When it reached the oaf at the end, however, he scratched his head in perplexity. What does the rabbi mean? Life is a river, he asked. The question, of course, traveled back up the line. What does the rabbi mean, life is a river? When the star pupil heard it, he leaned over again. Rabbi, he implored, for the old man was breathing his last. What do you mean, life is a river? And the rabbi shrugged and croaked. So it's not a river. A man who can shrug off the insufficiency of his ultimate wisdom, the meaninglessness of his profoundest thoughts, is a man in touch with the very soul of humor. And each of the six qualities contributes to the kind of sense of humor that is therapeutic. The six qualities are the kind of sense of humor each of us needs. Flexibility, willingness to examine every side of every side of an issue, spontaneity, unconventionality, shrewdness, playfulness, and humility. So how's your sense of humor these days? Do you know what typifies the healthy-minded, mature person perhaps more than anything else? To my mind, it's the simplicity of his needs. St. Francis of Assisi said, I need little, and that little... I need very little. If you'll think back to the 
truly great men and women of our time, and going all the way back in recorded history, you'll find that their lives were characterized by simplicity. Think of Edison, Einstein, Schweitzer, Gandhi. The list is endless, going all the way back to the great teachers of antiquity, Buddha, Socrates, Epictetus, Moses, Christ, all the truly great ones. And their lives were typified by their lack of the weight of possessions, their freedom from being owned by things, gadgets, gigaws, junk. After his crucifixion, Christ left a robe and a movement that was to change the world. The possessions of Gandhi, following his assassination, could be held in one hand. Now they were all people who lived in the spiritual and mental realms. They were not concerned with their own earthly existence, and we cannot be like them. The completely ascetic life is not attractive to us because we haven't grown inwardly to the point where we can become a Thoreau or a William Yeats. But we can simplify our lives until we have them under our control instead of it being the other way around. Our highly industrialized technological society could not exist six months without the farmer. But the farmer could exist all his life and raise a fine family without modern industry or technology. Although it would be admittedly much tougher on him. I'm glad we've progressed industrially and technologically to the point we've reached. It's great having the things we need in such abundance. But it's also good to decide upon what it is we need for a good and abundant life. Because if you're not careful... It's possible for your possessions to own you. I was on a television show with Zsa, Zsa Gabor many years ago, and noticing the enormous diamond she was wearing, asked her if she was afraid of being attacked and robbed, and she said no. A few months later, or perhaps it was a couple of years, I read in the paper that she had been attacked and beaten in an elevator of a New York hotel and her diamond stolen. It had not been insured. Now, all that problem and risk and ultimate loss because of going overboard on the size of a diamond... And a good question is, do I own the things I own for my own pleasure and convenience or to impress those about me? Getting back to that maturity business, the really mature person couldn't care less if he or she impresses anyone or not. Sometimes people in show business have to go to extremes for publicity, and it's good for their careers. It's a good investment for them unless it endangers their lives and limbs. But if you're interested in making an assessment of your degree of maturity... Look at the things you think are important in your life. The mature person carries his important possessions within. He or she isn't concerned too much about what others may think, nor does he or she need to make an impression on anyone. They see life in the world in a clearer, truer light. How many times have you heard a woman say, well, it's what they're wearing this year, which is another way of saying, this is the current uniform or whatever they wear, I will wear. And men are just as bad. If the style is drooping Jesse James gunfighter-type mustaches, you'll see them adorning male upper lips from Maine to California. You'll see them in your rearview mirror of your car and all about you on the street. Whatever starts out as something new and different immediately becomes the commonplace. The desire to copy others is so deeply ingrained in the human organism as to be a constant source of amazement. Until you remember the wise words of our friend Jose Ortega y Gasset. It is the natural state of man to find himself disoriented in his world. He is seeking orientation, a path to follow. And if others seem to know what they're doing or where they're going, well, he'll quickly get in line. Few people in our society are sufficiently mature, sufficiently wise, to go their own way regardless of the ebb and flow of fads and fashions. Few women have the kind of inner composure and are sure enough of what they like to pick their wardrobes from their own likes and dislikes and wear them, not in spite of the crowd, but in the simple independent desire to wear those clothes that most please them. It isn't a matter of men or women. It's a matter of human beings who have never developed a way of their own in the world. It isn't that the independent, free person wants to be an iconoclast and stand out as a character in the crowd. Just the opposite. He doesn't care if he stands out or not. He doesn't need to stand out. He's content with his evolving self. He's growing. He hopes to get better, but he's satisfied with his progress. It's perfectly natural that the person who lacks inner direction will seek to find direction in a group of some kind. This is not to say we should not belong to organizations, only that we should try to find out what is important to us and go our own way, or perhaps I should say grow our own way. I was rereading Dana's great classic two years before the mass and his description of California and its people back in the 1830s when it still belonged to Mexico. 
and of his fascinating adventures as an ordinary seaman. And he mentions that when the sailors on his ship got an occasional liberty, they would go to the nearest saloon, get thoroughly plastered, and finally be stripped of their possessions and tossed into the pokey where they would have to be ransomed the next morning. Now, he found it curious that sailors saw how fast they could become unconscious on their rare opportunities to go ashore. He, on the other hand, explored the countryside, met and talked with the people, learned the Spanish language, and kept notes in a journal that was to someday become a world classic and do much to raise the standard of living and the pay of sailors everywhere. He was the one man on the ship that didn't go with the traditional conduct of sailors, and he's the one that accomplished something. To be great at anything is to be a nonconformist. Mark Twain once said, Whenever you find yourself on the side of the majority, it's time to reform. It isn't a matter of going against the trends of the time. It's simply a matter of going your own way. Norman Cousins, in an editorial for the Saturday Review, observed, We have been concerned for some years with a lot of underprivileged people throughout the world, but we have yet to do anything for one of the most underprivileged of all, ourselves. We have more food than we can eat. We have more money per person than anywhere else in the world. With 6% of the population, we hold 80% of the wealth. We have bigger homes, bigger TV sets, bigger cars, bigger theaters, bigger schools. We have everything we need, in fact, except the most important thing of all. Time to think and the habit of thought. We lack time for the one indispensable for safety of an individual or a nation. Thought is the basic energy in human history. Civilization is put together not by machines, but by thought. Similarly, man's uniqueness is represented not by his ability to make objects, but to sort them and relate them. Other animals practice communications. Only man has capacity for comprehension. Displace or eliminate thought, and the species itself has, well, as little claim on survival as the dinosaurs with their four-foot skulls and the pea-sized brains. The impotence of the brute alongside the power of the sage, is represented by thought. We seem to have no time for thought. The paradox, of course, is that we're busy doing nothing. Never before has so much leisure time been available to so many. Leisure hours now exceed working hours. But we have a genius for cluttering. We've somehow managed to persuade ourselves that we're too busy to think, too busy to read, too busy to look back, too busy to look ahead, too busy to understand that all our wealth and all our power are not enough to safeguard our future unless there's also a real understanding of the danger that threatens us and how to meet it. Thus, being busy is more than merely a national passion. It's a national excuse. The real question, however, concerns not the time or lack of it we provide for thought, but the value we place on thought. What standing does thoughtfulness enjoy in the community at large? What great works of contemporary literature assign importance to thought or make heroes of thoughtful men? Action, accumulation, diversion, these seem to be the great imperatives. We're so busy increasing the size and ornamentation of our personal kingdoms that we're unaware that no age in history has had as many loose props under it as our own. Interesting, isn't it? How much time do you spend in thought? How much attention to thought is paid in school? in the home, in your home. People yell that they want more. It's impossible to think with the mouth open. And as long as we live, we'll never learn anything of value when we're talking or yelling or demanding. What is needed, most assuredly, is more quiet, reflective, creative thinking. Lincoln once said, the occasion is piled high with difficulty, and we must rise with the occasion. As our case is new, so we must think anew and act anew. We must disenthrall ourselves. On a national and individual basis, we need to define our priorities, organize them in the order of their importance, and attack them with creative thought, realizing that we need new solutions to new problems. We need to set aside a time each day for thought. I came across an interesting idea while reading in my office today. See what you think of it. What we have come to call the counterculture is actually an interlocking net of ideas for alternative living, different in crucial ways from the traditional middle class, and yet reflecting characteristically traditional aspirations. And this counterculture's progressively greater impact becomes a powerful motor for social change. Now, what it means is that the great changes in ideas of what constitutes a meaningful life 
are not so much an attempt to pull down the old traditional ways of living, but rather they are alternatives. They're experiments in alternatives designed to find new and better ways of living in a more enlightened age. The key term today is alternatives, meaning articulated options beyond the realm of current practice. The younger people, often called the counterculture, are aware that the world they find themselves in today isn't going to win many prizes in the happiness and joy departments. It's a curious thing, but people were much happier in this country back in the 30s and 40s, even the 50s, than they seem to be today. Affluence has brought with it a pervasive dissatisfaction and irritability that didn't used to exist. Having more of the things they thought they wanted has not made people noticeably kinder, more unselfish, nor more cheerful than they used to be. In former days, it seemed as though everybody knew what he wanted. He knew what was important, what the priorities were, at least in his own life. Today, people appear to be rootless, drifting, aimless. They want more, but they don't seem willing to do more. Now, I'm not saying that all the ideas coming from the younger generation are good, but neither are they all bad just because they come from people under 25 or 30. The quotation I used earlier is from an interesting essay entitled Alternative Thinking by Richard Castellanos, which appeared in The Humanist and was adopted from his book Human Alternatives, published by Morrow. We will all certainly agree, I think, that we need some alternatives to war as a way of life, or rather death. We need alternatives to the carnage on the highway, to the choked ghettos of our city, to increasing pollution. You know, to Buckminster Fuller, pollution is nothing more than resources we're not harvesting. And I have agreed for years that the more reasonable solutions for pollution today involve not less technology, but more, regardless of added expense. It's impossible to turn back the clock as well as undesirable. What is needed is to turn it forward, to find a human second wind freedom from some of the threatening forces with which we're faced today, and a renewal of interest, even excitement, with regard to man and his future. I'm delighted that we have this so-called counterculture coming up with alternative ideas for a more meaningful kind of living. It's as ridiculous and stupid for older people to attempt to disregard the ideas of those under 25 as it is for those under 25 to disregard the ideas and solid accomplishments of those over 30. Have you ever thought about the fact that 99% of our business dealings are with the lowest paid, least interested, and poorest trained people of an organization? We deal with the checkout people and the bag boy, the receptionist, the telephone operator of our company, and in our financial transactions with the person behind the counter. When something goes wrong with one of our appliances, we don't deal with the president of a company or other high-ranking official. We deal with the service man or woman, usually man, and in the case of our car, with the service manager and the mechanic. With the transportation company, well, it's the bus driver or the ticket taker. With the airlines, it's the reservation girl, the person behind the counter, or the stewardess. It's the same with virtually all of our myriad transactions. That's the way it has to be, of course, and for the most part, the people with whom we deal are fine people with a genuine interest in doing a good job. But in all but a very few notable cases, the great bulk of these fine people have not been thoroughly indoctrinated with the company's goals and problems nor do they receive from the company material calculated to help them grow and mature as persons. Company officers will say the growth and maturity of these people as persons is their own problem and responsibility. And while that's regrettably the case, leaving people to obtain that kind of information on their own is to make certain that 95% of them will do nothing about it. Now, what the business community overlooks is that people are eager for growth, and that as they grow and mature as persons, that growth and maturity is reflected in everything they do on the job and off. Few top corporate executives have any idea of the almost unbelievable latent force for growth that exists within the people they're now paying. With no increase in personnel, their present people can easily do twice what they're now doing, and perhaps a good deal more than that. Not because they're forced or coerced into doing more, but because they can learn the fun and interest and growth that can be obtained by bringing more of themselves to bear on their lives, all departments of their lives. The fact is that most people, including these top corporate executives are operating on from 5 to 10 percent of their true capacity. They are, as Dr. William James of Harvard liked to put it, only half awake. And the great majority are getting by, as Huxley discovered, without too much discredit. The answer, in my opinion, is a steady stream of interesting educational material aimed at motivating a person to push back his mental horizons and see himself as an original, enormously creative and competent person with deep, 
largely unplumbed reservoirs of ability, even genius, which he has probably habitually failed to use, for the simple reason that to get by in our society, he doesn't have to. There's a perfectly natural tendency on the part of most people to pattern their lives after the lives of those by whom they're habitually surrounded. Lacking the kind of leadership they could have, they passively mold themselves, for the most part, into their existing environment. Poking around in the files, I ran across this item I clipped from an old newspaper. It's the United Press story, Dateline San Pedro, California, and has to do with a family that inherited $200,000. What did they do with it? They blew it, as they put it, and today they're right back where they were before. The mother of four children who lives with her husband and family in a rented home in San Pedro inherited the money from her father's estate. It took two years for the lawyers to haggle and the government to scrape off its take, the lawyers to divvy up as much as they could lay their hands on, and when the smoke cleared one year later, there was a sum of $200,000 left after all taxes and expenses. That's a tidy sum. Properly invested, it could grow into a million dollars before too long. But they managed to go through it in just one year. When asked how they managed to do it, the wife replied, Well, we bought cars and motorcycles for the two boys and a truck and a $2,000 hi-fi with all the components and clothes, and we put a down payment on a house, and the girls and I all had our teeth kept, and I had my breasts lifted, and, oh, yes, we uh, bought ski equipment, and, and we traveled. We put 200,000 miles on one of the cars in one year, and we all saw psychiatrists. It seems all that money pulled the family right together and they grimly went about the business of unloading it as fast as someone could think of something to buy, and it was only after the money was gone that the recriminations began. As the briefly rich daughter of the deceased put it, we started fighting. They kept saying, why didn't we spend it this way? Why did you spend it that way? But they were there to spend it. If she had it all to do over again, well, she said, if our family was smart, we would have bought a few luxuries and invested the rest of the money. But did she honestly believe they'd do it that way? Nope, she said. I'd do exactly the same thing I did. I'd blow it. Well, I hope they had fun. It's their business, their money. But the day may come when they're a bit older that they'll start hitting each other over the head for not putting at least some of that loot to pasture to grow for those important retirement years. The father could have avoided his daughter and her husband going on that one-year spree if he had left a will and the money in trust for them. It would also have avoided the legal fees in the Uncle Sam's big bucket and probably would have grown to a half million or so, with plenty of money still going to the daughter and her family, who could have gradually spent much more money for many more things over a much longer period of time and still ended up well-to-do in their retirement years. Well, let's make sure we have a will. An attorney will help us draw one up so that what we leave will be disposed of as we think it ought to be. If, after all, it's our estate... I noticed that uh, she mentioned last that they all saw a psychiatrist. Maybe that was their mistake. Maybe they should have seen him first. But it was their money. And as she said, when it finally came, it, well, it really wore us out spending it. We were just exhausted. In his fine book, Embers of the Mind, Scott Buchanan wrote, Imagination is the medium in which all things are done. And I think it was our old friend Henry Miller who said, Imagination is everything. And to paraphrase Kant, your imagination is the condition for the possibility of experience. I don't think we've given enough thought or attention to the importance of imagination. Under certain circumstances, imagination is a torment. We imagine all manner of terrors in the dark of night before a visit to the dentist or physician or when we're called on the carpet. The steer, as he walks towards swift extinction in the packing house, suffers no terrors of the imagination. The blow falls upon a creature experiencing only mild anxiety, perhaps, in the presence of strange surroundings. But the condemned human being dies a thousand times in his imagination. But while the imagination is a scourge, it's also our hope and joy, and, as Scott Buchanan said, it is the medium in which all things are done. It is the seat of self-fulfilling prophecy as we plan for the goal we've decided to reach. It's the autopilot of our lives and it works all its life on problems. And here there seem to be two main classes of imagination. Those that concentrate on the problem and its possible dire consequences, and those that concentrate on the solution. Now, in the first case, life is a reflection of the problems on which the imagination is focused. In the second, it's a matter of solutions of overcoming problems. 
We tend to forget that our opportunities are an exact ratio to our problems. I'm sure there are a few glaring exceptions to that, but it's generally true. The greatest and most successful industries are nothing more than those evolving solutions to problems. The illuminating and heating and cooking industries, the telephone, steel, automobile, and airplane, uh, my bookshelves, my typewriter, my clothes, my home, they're all solutions to problems. Today, mankind is faced with towering problems, and his opportunities match them. Think of the hundreds of thousands of people who will one day be gainfully employed in the pollution control industry and in population control. Look at the growth of medicine, of the pharmaceutical industry. Billions of dollars will be earned in disposing of and recycling trash and garbage, all major problems. It reminds me of the old question, whenever there's something wrong, are you part of the problem or part of the answer? It was just some 9,000 years ago that we began banding together in communities and husbanding crops and animals. Since then, every time a human creature stopped what he was doing and got a questioning look on his face, his imagination was at work. And if we can do what we have done in just the past 100 years, there are no problems our imaginations can't solve in the future. Imagination is the medium in which all things are done. How are you doing in the imagination department? In the 19th century, Ralph Waldo Emerson predicted in his journal that American prosperity would go on to madness. And in René Dubois' Pulitzer Prize-winning book, So Human an Animal, he writes, In the past, great prosperity has often damaged human values and generated boredom. The environmental crisis in the modern world indicates, furthermore, that mismanaged prosperity may destroy human life altogether. Prosperity is a strange and wonderful and terrifying thing where human beings are concerned. It does wonders for a nation up to a point, and the same goes for any organization of value. Prosperity means good health up to a point, and then it militates against good health. Cardiovascular disease has become a modern plague in the United States, with 20 other countries having longer average lifespans for no other reason than the fact that too many Americans have grown too fat. Prosperity can put a pacemaker in the heart of an infant otherwise doomed, and then kill him 10 to 20 years sooner than he might otherwise live by fattening him to death. As a general rule, prosperity does not bring out the best in a people. Up to a point, yes. Beyond that point, no. You know, in tests with chimpanzees, it was discovered that the young get along perfectly together, playing happily with virtually no discord whatever, until a possession is introduced into the group and given to one chimp. That chimp immediately becomes violently possessive, and the other chimps become restive, wanting whatever it is the one has. It destroys their relationship and introduces sullenness and bickering where before there was happiness and play. It often works the same way with nations or a community, and it seems people have a way of getting their priorities all fouled up. It's believed that much of the dissatisfaction found in so many millions of people who seem to be rushing headlong in shallow circles is due to mistaken priorities. They're affluent, all right, but often lack the maturity to determine what's really important and good and what isn't. They get confused about what things are simply means to an end and what things are ends in themselves. And after 20 years or so slip by, they find themselves standing in the middle of a great collection of junk, which is all in various stages of obsolescence. They often appear like children in a room full of toys, too many toys, so many toys that they're bored to death with toys. As René Dubois put it, in the past... Great prosperity has often damaged human values and generated boredom. It seems to many people who have an immature sense of values that there's nothing more to buy. So now what do you do? Like wind-up toys that have run down, they stand in the midst of all that they once wanted and find that it's not enough. Not nearly enough. I want to share with you a letter written by a young lady, a senior at McLean High School. She writes, I was raised as a virtually free American in Watts, a section of Los Angeles that has been called a slum by sightseers and a depressed area by sociologists. As a child, I never noticed. We had an overabundance of unsightly tenements, smelly pool rooms, dirty streets, and flying garbage, yet I never felt underprivileged, depressed, or deprived. To outsiders, my environment might have appeared to be miserable, but in all honesty, I must say that I was not aware of this. I can be considered fortunate because poverty never destroyed or even damaged my ideas or standards. Sociologists would probably label me as the 
privileged poor, and indeed I am privileged. But poor, I am not. Henry Ward Beecher once said, No man can judge whether he is rich or poor by turning to his ledger. It is the heart that makes men rich. He is rich according to what he is, not what he has. We moved out of Watts, and six years later I began to hear rumors of what I, a person from a slum, was supposed to be. For the first time in my life I realized that Watts had been pictured in many people's minds as a 20th century tobacco road. This was after the riots. This was when mass media began to degrade not only Watts, but all lower middle class communities as well. After the riots, scores of projects were started. Everyone thought he knew the answer. They thought the answer was money. The money began to pour in, trying to force upper-middle-class standards on a lower-middle-class society. The front-page headlines told of how the people didn't have the money to buy the necessities of life, yet they'd existed, survived, and lived for many years. As time passed, the people began to believe the stories themselves. They no longer wanted to live happily as they had in the past, not luxuriously, but contentedly. Now they saw themselves as others saw them. They felt cheated and left out. The more money that poured in, the more money was needed to satisfy this new thirst. Now father can go to work and feel like a slave for eight hours a day, and sis can't go to school because her clothes aren't good enough. You can bet that when they sit down to meatloaf, they think of others eating steak. All the bills in the legislature can't stop poverty. All the money in the treasury can't buy poverty. People cannot advance as a group until they have the desire to do so. In order for the poor to come out of poverty, they must take the first step themselves. As a teenager, and as a former citizen of Watts, I feel that now is the time to inform the younger generation that they can change the present conditions when they accept the fact that no one owes them anything, that now is the time to take the first step out of the impoverished area. As Booker T. Washington phrased it, cast down your buckets where you are. I am, according to books, magazines, and movies, an underprivileged, deprived, depressed person with supposedly no hope for the future. But I stand as a symbol. You can be what you want to be, not disregarding your background, but quite often because of it. This high school senior ended her letter by writing, But I stand as a symbol. You can be what you want to be, not disregarding your background, but quite often because of it. I hope this girl's letter gets wide dissemination. Thank you. I clipped an item from the July 1973 issue of Psychology Today, which indicates that hair on the face of a man does a great deal more than just itch and provide a haven for germs. My old friend Commander Whitehead of Schweppes will hardly agree with this. Psychologist Robert Pellegrini, reporting in Psychology Magazine, has found that men who shave off their facial foliage lose some of their ability to make good first impressions, at least in the eyes of 128 college students. Pellegrini of the California State University of San Jose paid eight fully bearded young men to shave off their whiskers. And a consultant from a local barber college shaved them down to goatees, then to mustaches, and finally to bare skin. A photographer took pictures of them at all four stages, and Pellegrini randomly gave each of the students one photo to judge, so that each picture was rated by two males and two females. And the results were clear. The more hair a person had, the more he was judged to be masculine, mature, good-looking, self-confident, dominant, courageous, liberal, nonconformist, and industrious. Pellegrini believes that the images associated with bearded men are cultural in origin rather than evolutionary. By that he means that hairy faces are not a fad, but are deeply rooted in our culture. The bearded face has been associated with personalities as diverse as those of Jesus Christ, Sigmund Freud, Abraham Lincoln, Ernest Hemingway, Santa Claus, and Attila the Hun, says Pellegrini. But if we were to characterize the observed pattern by a single personality, it might very well be that of the indomitable Buffalo Bill. Judging from the data in the present research, the male beard communicates an heroic image of the independent, sturdy, and resourceful pioneer, ready, willing, and able to do manly things. He says that it may very well be true that inside every clean-shaven man, there is a beard screaming to be let out. But in my opinion, a hairy face does even more than Dr. Pellegrini suggests. It can also cover a whole lot of otherwise self-image-damaging facial characteristics. Few men are endowed with a complete set of handsome features, and the mustache and beard simply cover them up. 
Facial hair can act as a buffer between a man's self-consciousness about less-than-ideal facial attributes and the gaze of other human beings. I've often noted that men with beards and mustaches appear quite acceptable, even good-looking, when it's quite obvious under close scrutiny that they would not be nearly so without their natural buffers. This is especially so, I think, when they keep them neatly trimmed. Facial hair has a way of imparting an impression of independence and wisdom as well as manliness when these qualities might otherwise be completely absent. And perhaps the most curious thing of all is that women don't seem to be turned off by all that hair. Kissing a man with a lot of facial hair must be like kissing a ripped horsehair mattress, but they don't seem to mind. But then who understands women anyway? Then, too, a Miami psychiatrist recently reported something that I think most of us have known all along, that the better-looking people, those with unusually attractive or athletic physical attributes, often find life so easy for them in the beginning, they don't prepare themselves to win over the long haul. Beautiful girls find it easier to find jobs, but often experience more difficulty in holding them. And if they let their beauty represent their major way of dealing with the world, when the beauty fades, as alas it must, they're often left defenseless and unable to successfully cope with life. Dr. Greenberg says the star quarterback in college is a campus hero, but when he leaves college, he discovers that life is not a football game. It's the people who have to work hard for what they get who develop the skills to successfully cope with life over the long pull who tend to make the grade. However, good-looking people usually have a better self-image and as a result will tackle jobs and take chances their less good-looking peers might hesitate to try. The best bet seems to be good-looking or attractive or very acceptable without being of the sensationally beautiful or handsome variety. And if you're a man, there's always the facial hair to fall back on or forward on. The National Enquirer, that interesting little newspaper with the largest circulation of any paper in the United States, which has gone a long way to prove that news doesn't have to be all bad to sell newspapers, carried a story by Joseph Cassidy that 80% of American workers are unhappy and frustrated with their jobs, according to a research firm's interviews with 250,000 employees from all walks of life. Four out of every five working Americans today are misemployed, said Dr. Herbert M. Greenberg, a Princeton, New Jersey psychologist. They're doing jobs they're not suited for and are thus miserable, added Dr. Greenberg, who is president of Marketing Survey and Research Corporation. These people hate to get up in the morning and go to work. Once on the job, they can't wait to go home. This is a terrible waste to our economy because of staggering losses in productivity. A terrible waste to individual companies since their misplaced employees might be doing a good job in another post. And a terrible waste to the worker himself who is living an unfulfilled, unhappy life. The real job market tragedy in the United States today is not unemployment. It's misemployment. Dr. Greenberg said he bases his conclusions on interviews that he and his associates have conducted since 1957, with 250,000 employees of 4,000 firms representing every job category and educational group from every part of the country. He says that job frustration is as high at the managerial level as it is at lower levels. You'd think that assembly line workers would be less satisfied than managers, but this just isn't so, he said. Both the blue-collar worker and his boss are caught in jobs they don't like, and both are digging themselves into deeper, more frustrating ruts. People too often stumble into jobs and become caught in a pattern. Relatively few of them ever overcome their accidental beginnings. Instead, they fight their way through to do an adequate job and even succeed to the point where they're considered successful, but who are really very unhappy and who are not living up to their potential. Misemployment is costing American business billions of dollars a year. Among sales forces, for instance, says Dr. Greenberg, 20% of the salesmen sell more than 80% of the products and services. The rest of the salesmen are obviously the wrong jobs. And take the production line worker who daydreams or plays games on the job to keep his sanity. We have millions of unemployed who would consider a job on that assembly line a tremendous plus. People aren't lazy, he said. If they like their jobs, they'll want to go to work and do a good job. Help a guy find his niche and he'll be a winner. Employers rely too much on what a person's done rather than what his potentials are. American business must scrap this outmoded, typecasting approach to hiring. What's the use of having 20 years' experience if a person is in the wrong job for him? And as for training an employee, training is only effective when you're training the right raw material. In the same issue of the Inquirer, there's a story of two Chicago-area bankers who quit their jobs and bought a general store in Alaska. They're not making the money they used to make, but they say they're a lot happier, and so are their families. 
Now, all the unhappy, unmotivated working people in the country can't open general stores in Alaska, even though a good percentage of them could go into small businesses of their own and learn to live a new lifestyle. But unhappy workers don't necessarily indicate that the basic jobs are wrong. The problem may often lie with faulty motivation and lack of job enrichment. In 1971, a special research study made for members of the President's Association titled Motivation and Effectiveness and authored by my good friend Frank C. Goebel was issued in which Mark Shepard, Jr., president of Texas Instruments, was quoted as saying, The challenge of increasing human effectiveness is emerging as the remaining frontier offering competitive advantage to the organizations most successful in channeling human talent and energy into constructive outlets. The reservoir is vast as talent at all levels is poorly utilized. And another friend of mine, consultant Joe Batten, stated that American business is currently overlooking its greatest productive ace in the hole. Literally millions of people are leaving their jobs every evening with much of their energy and productivity still unused. They throw themselves into bowling, little league, baseball, and other activities with a kind of enthusiasm and identification that management has not even tapped. If you're interested in making a study of how to best motivate employees, I suggest you might get a copy of this report. It has an excellent bibliography under references in the back, which would, in my opinion, represent one of the best libraries available on this subject. And another excellent little book I can recommend for guidelines in interpersonal relationships is Why Do You See It That Way? by Michael E. Kalabowski and Lawrence J. Taylor. I've often been struck by the meager libraries of so-called business executives. I guess they believe that managerial and creative talent and know-how is supposed to come to them in dreams, and that they're somehow above the necessity to read the words of others. They're mistaken, and are as often as not holding their jobs because of the shortage of real management talent today. They're often living examples of the Peter Principle. I believe you can judge the reach of a person's mind and capacities as well as his real interests by examining his or her library. I have known so-called experts on various subjects who don't own ten books on their favorite subject. They just keep saying the same things over and over again, hoping, I suppose, for a fresh audience every time they speak. And I've also found that one of the most unrewarding projects of a top manager who would inspire those below him is to recommend or even loan books. For the most part, they're not read. There's only one way to obtain knowledge, and that is through study. But as Ortega said, studying is for most people like paying income taxes. They'll never do it unless they have to. And it's one of the main reasons that there are six to ten top jobs in every field for every person qualified to handle it. If people aspiring to top management had to go through the kind of training that commercial pilots have to wade through, business failures would be as rare as commercial airplane crashes. In the world of business, the system seems to be to show up for work long enough, don't rock the boat, smile a lot, and time will take care of the rest. In the world of business, you might not be any smarter than you were ten years ago, but you're there, and when the opening occurs, eventually they've got to put you into it. Once in, a good secretary can keep you there. A good idea would be to provide a bookcase with every junior executive office. Then, from time to time, make the rounds and watch the bookcases. Their growing contents, or the lack of them, will give you an excellent appraisal yardstick for future promotion, or the lack of it. Noting the kind of books would give you an insight into the real interests of the person and help you steer him in the right direction. For example, the books might be on fishing, in which case you could suggest that he go fishing permanently or apply for a job with a fishing tackle manufacturer. But unless he's buying and reading books on management skills, he's not preparing himself for management. He's just marking time. Like most people aspiring to management positions, he probably feels that management skills come naturally at birth, like a navel or ten toes. And, of course, they don't. And here's something I like very much and found in Lewis Mumford's book, The Transformations of Man. We have arrived at a truism that has so far been forgotten it has the air of a paradox. The need to become human is man's first need, and perhaps it remains his deepest one. Nature provides the materials for this change, but man himself must affect it. In essence, it rests on a constant effort at self-identification, self-affirmation, self-discipline, and self-development. By becoming human, man exchanges the stable natural self native to each biological species for a countless multitude of possible selves molded for the working out of a special drama and plot 
that he himself helps to create. In order to effect an ongoing, self-renewing change, we need maintain a constant effort at self-identification, self-affirmation, self-discipline, and self-development. And here's something from the writings of Martin Buber that I found to be one of the most powerful and moving things I've ever read. Man wishes to be confirmed in his being by man and wishes to have a presence in the being of another. Secretly and bashfully, he watches for a yes which allows him to be and which can come to him only from one human person to another. We notice this most with our dealings with children, but it also holds true with every person with whom we have any sort of real contact. We need to be confirmed in our being by others. We wish and need to have a presence in the being of another. And secretly and bashfully we watch for a yes, which allows us to be, and which can come to us only from one human person to another. I thought that was beautiful. Everyone will agree, or at least give lip service, to the concept that he'd like to be a completely free and autonomous person. But we learn from an excellent book by Walter Kaufman entitled Without Guilt and Justice that humanity craves but dreads autonomy. One does not want to live under the yoke of guilt and fear. Autonomy consists of making with open eyes the decisions that give shape to one's life. But being afraid of making fateful decisions, one is tempted to hide autonomy in a metaphysical fog and to become sidetracked and bogged down in puzzles about free will and determinism. It's far easier to define autonomy out of existence than it is to achieve autonomy in the very meaningful sense in which it can be attained. The difference between making the decisions that govern our lives with our eyes open and somehow avoiding this is all important. The best way to begin to understand autonomy is to examine some of the major strategies people use to avoid it. And this I shall do, he writes, and he does brilliantly. In this book, Kaufman examines ten strategies by which people avoid making the kind of faithful and meaningful decisions about their lives that could transform them into courageous and autonomous persons. He calls those who avoid making such decisions decidophobes and the condition of avoiding decisions, decidophobia. He points out that people do not fear all decisions. Decidophobes, far from dreading meticulous distinctions, may actually revel in them, for immersion in microscopic decisions is one good way of avoiding fateful decisions. Before getting into the ten strategies people use to avoid making decisions, he points out that it's easy to understand why parents cultivate acrophobia, the fear of falling in their children. Precipitous heights are dangerous, and having been taught to dread them, one communicates one's dread to one's children. That's much easier than teaching them prudence, self-reliance, and the skills required to enjoy peaks. All this applies just as much to decidophobia. Anyone making faithful decisions that affect others without feeling any apprehension would be a menace. Anyone who would unhesitatingly plunge into choices that are likely to mold his own character in future would be so unpredictable that he too would endanger the social fabric. The easiest way to ensure stability is to engender fear. Teaching the skills required for responsible decision making is much harder. Choosing responsibly means that one weighs alternatives. He develops this theme further in his chapter on the new integrity. But comparing faithful alternatives and choosing between them with one's eyes open, fully aware of the risks, is what frightens the decidophobe. Now, basically, he has three options. To avoid faithful decisions, to stack the cards so that one alternative is clearly the right one and there seems to be no risk involved at all, and to decline responsibility. He need not even choose between these options. They can be combined. In brief, avoid if possible. If that does not work, stack. And in any case, make sure that you do not stand alone. It would be reasonable to feel apprehension in direct proportion to the number of those whom our decision is likely to affect importantly. But people tend to attach disproportionate importance to themselves. The decisions they dread most are those that shape their character and their future. He goes on to write, I shall examine ten strategies that help decidophobes to avoid dizziness. All of them involve the refusal to scrutinize significant alternatives. 
When anyone shuts his eyes in a crisis, it is plausible to assume that he's afraid. But if he merely acts as if he were afraid, he's still open to criticism. My critique of decidophobia applies also to those who are not afraid, but merely behave as if they were. And he goes on to write, Before I consider the ten strategies, let me comment very briefly on two writers who have illuminated decidophobia and one who has not. He then goes into a discussion of Kierkegaard, the father of existentialism, and Jean-Paul Sartre, and mentions his, Sartre's famous declaration in 1943, that man is condemned to be free, suggesting clearly that man finds freedom hard to bear. He points out that in Sartre's philosophy, man is freedom, but always tends to look upon himself as if he were a thing. Thus he succumbs to what Sartre calls mauvaise foi. In my language, this bad faith and these constant self-deceptions are prompted by decidophobia. And after commenting on Eric Fromm's book, Escape from Freedom, and the example of how Hitler achieved complete control of Germany's fate, he examines the ten strategies most common to decidophobes. In first place, he lists religion and points out that, as a rule, one does not even decide to submit to the authority of a religion. One is born into the fold and then confirmed at the threshold of adolescence before one has any chance to explore alternatives and make a choice. One does not so much decide to stay as one does not decide to leave. The cytophobia keeps one in the fold. Admitting quite readily that not all religious people are decidophobes, he says that nevertheless religion represents one of the most popular strategies for avoiding the most fateful decisions. In fact, it's nothing less than a classical strategy. Number two he lists as drifting. It represents another, even less deliberate strategy, and it comes in two forms. Model A is extremely popular with those over 30 without being confined to them. Status quoism. Instead of choosing how to live, with whom, where, what to do, and what to believe, one simply drifts along in the status quo. All decisions are made, none need to be made. Some people need a regular supply of alcohol or tranquilizers to remain satisfied with Model A. This form of inauthenticity is readily perceived by many students, and a few go to the opposite extreme, which is Model B. One drops out, has no ties, and is not guided by tradition. One has no code, no plan, no major purpose. One lives from moment to moment, rarely knowing in advance what one will do next. Model B can also be lubricated with alcohol, but since World War II, this kind of drifting has been associated more often with other drugs. Some of those who have drifted in a Model B are afraid of making almost any decision. If they hitchhike, they go wherever they're taken. They leave things to chance. Everything depends on whatever impulse happens to be felt at the moment. To be governed by caprice is to drift. The hero of Camus' novel, The Stranger, illustrates this orientation. When this way of life breeds a sense of emptiness and despair, one becomes receptive to the siren song of commitment. Allegiance to a movement is the third strategy. Such allegiance, again, is not always decidophobic. Some movements have little bearing on faith and morals, goals, and lifestyles. If so, membership is marginal, although it may still be prompted by a fear of standing alone and some sense that there is safety in numbers. Total immersion, in which no crucial decisions at all remain to be made, is the exception, not the rule. Allegiance to a school of thought comes next, followed by exegetical thinking. Walter Kaufman points out that exegetical thinking assumes that the text that one interprets is right. Thus, the text is treated as an authority. If what it seems to say is wrong, the exegesis must be inadequate. The interpreter is wrong, never the text. Incidentally, I'm just hitting the high spots. He goes into a complete description and evaluation of each strategy as he lists it. The sixth strategy is Manichaeism. The Manichaean insists on the need for a decision, but the choice is loaded and practically makes itself. It's like being asked to choose between two dishes of food and being told that this one is poisoned and will make you sick, while that one tastes incomparably better and will improve your health and expand your consciousness. All good is on one side, all evil on the other. Inconvenient facts are ignored or denied. The falsification of history becomes an indispensable crutch, and uncomfortable arguments are discredited as coming from the forces of evil. There's no need for quandaries that keep men sleepless, and he points out that it's easier to ridicule this strategy than to resist it. 
The seventh strategy is much the subtlest of the lot, and Kaufman calls it moral rationalism. It claims that purely rational procedures can show what one ought to do or what would constitute a just society. There is then no need at all to choose between different ideals, different societies, different goals. Once again, no room is left for tragic quandaries or fateful choices. He then writes, I have considered seven ways of avoiding autonomy. One, religion. Two, drifting. Three, allegiance to a movement. Four, allegiance to a school of thought. Five, exegetical thinking. Six, Manichaeism. And seven, moral rationalism. It is possible to systematize these seven strategies under two headings. First, avoiding fateful decisions, methods one to five. And second, making fateful decisions, but stacking the cards in some way so that the choice will make itself and there's no possibility of tragedy. Choices six and seven. The eighth strategy for avoiding autonomy is pedantry. It plays a central part in the creeping microscopism mentioned earlier. And I've noted previously, he writes, that as long as one remains absorbed in microscopic distinctions, one is in no great danger of coming face to face with fateful decisions. Of course, careful attention to detail is not only compatible with autonomy, but a requirement of intellectual integrity. Pedantry becomes decidophobic at the point where a person never gets around to considering major decisions with any care and closes his eyes to macroscopic alternatives, and the same criteria apply to all the other strategies. The ninth strategy is the faith that one is riding the wave of the future. This, too, is usually part of a mixed strategy and frequently associated with religion, allegiance to a movement, belonging to a school of thought, or Manichaeism. Those who employ the ninth strategy never stand alone or unsupported. They always feel backed up by force majeure, astrology, oracles, and the Chinese I Ching, which achieved such immense popularity in the United States during the 1960s, have always attracted decidophobes. And the tenth and final strategy is marriage. The tenth strategy finally often spells total relief, like the first two, At first glance, it looks quite different from the others and therefore out of place, but it's probably the most popular strategy of all. When getting married, legions of women have echoed Ruth's beautiful words, which in the Bible are not spoken to a husband. Your people shall be my people, your God my God. Henceforth, they agree to make no more faithful decisions. They'll leave that to their husbands. This pattern is deeply ingrained in many cultures. It's what a woman is expected to do when she gets married, and she's expected to get married. Actually, it doesn't always work that way. The man who boasts of making all the big decisions while he leaves the small ones to his wife may admit when asked to explain that big decisions concern what we should do about China. Small decisions deal with such matters as buying a house and where to live. Figuratively speaking, many men marry their mothers. It would be wrong to suppose either that marriage must involve decidophobia or that when it does, only one spouse can have succumbed. This strategy can work for both husband and wife. Often a couple is a committee of two and makes decisions the way committees usually do. A consensus is presumed and not questioned if all goes well. But if things turn out badly, one does not feel altogether responsible. One merely went along. Left to one's own devices, one might have acted quite differently. In a bad marriage, such excuses are stated expressly. In a so-called good marriage, they're entertained privately. However unworthy it may be to harbor such thoughts, there is much more than a grain of truth in them. Left to their own devices, both partners or on a committee, most or even all members might indeed have made a different decision. As it happened, nobody made any decision at all. And that was one of the main features of the whole arrangement from the start. Marriage is a way of avoiding the necessity of having to make fateful decisions. Instead of making a decision, one talks until something transpires. Another way of putting this point is less nasty and is unassailably true. In marriage, one no longer stands alone. Both partners have somebody to lean on, if all goes well. It does require a fateful decision to get married in the first place, but that decision may have been prompted by decidophobia, by the desire to escape loneliness, by an unwillingness to make decisions in solitude. Now, there's nothing paradoxical in that. 
Kierkegaard's famous leap into commitment is quite typically the plunge one takes from a solitary height to be rid of freedom. It would require a fateful decision to go to a surgeon and say, please, doctor, give me a frontal lobotomy. But it would not be in the least paradoxical to say that anyone who made that choice was a decidophobe who had come to the conclusion that he could not take it anymore. Now, believe it or not, the part of the book that I've reviewed here constitutes only a part of the first 30 pages. And it's from here on out that the brilliance of Walter Kaufman shows us how and why we tend to sidestep autonomy, why we tend to tiptoe through life as though we're trying to make it safely to death. I believe every person who has any intention whatsoever of leading anything approaching a life of autonomy and freedom should read and reread this book. Walter Kaufman, born in 1921, came to the United States from Germany in 39, received his Ph.D. from Harvard in 47, has been teaching philosophy at Princeton since that time. He's been a Phi Beta Kappa visiting scholar, Fulbright research professor at the University of Heidelberg, Fulbright professor at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and visiting professor at Columbia, Cornell, Purdue, Michigan, and Washington universities, and at the New School of Social Research. Somehow I'd managed to miss his earlier books, but I've since ordered several of them. I agree wholeheartedly with Professor John G. Stessinger, who said of this book that it proposes a new and liberating human ethic, that of creative autonomy. The author's argument is intellectually incandescent and logically compelling. The book is bound to become a major landmark in modern philosophy. By all means, read Without Guilt and Justice, From Decidophobia to Autonomy, by Walter Kaufman, and add it to the important section of your library. He goes on to describe the autonomous person and lists actual persons whom he thinks have earned that rare and wonderful state. The bibliography at the back of the book will introduce you, as it did me, to many other books you want to add to your collection. Success as a human being, and in our work in life, always seems to hinge on the making of big and fateful decisions. How often have you heard someone say, If only I had done so-and-so and I had the opportunity, or after having finally made a major decision, say, I should have done this 20 years ago. In Dr. Pearl's book on Gestalt therapy, he recalls that when an opportunity came along for a psychotherapist to take an opening in South Africa, several good men in Germany turned it down. He took it and became quite wealthy and famous as a result, while those who had refused the post ended up in Hitler's death camps. This is not to say that we need jump at every opportunity that beckons or that we're going to be killed if we don't. But there's a little doubt that we might take a much more adventurous attitude toward life and growth and look with great care on such opportunities when they present themselves. And this excellent book helps us examine ourselves and decide which, if any of his ten strategies, have been keeping us in the shallows when we might have sailed into deeper and more interesting seas. There appeared a story in the Chicago Daily News based on an article in Nation's Business by Associate Professor Lawrence L. Steinmetz, uh, which pointed up the fact that often the best thing that can happen to a person is to be fired from his job. As one executive put it, getting fired was the best thing that ever happened to me. I feel like thanking the guy who did it. And he was typical of a group of fired managers who told Professor Steinmetz of the University of Colorado that they are happier, better off financially, and better adjusted for having been canned. The school survey revealed that 70% of those fired now rate their relationship with their new bosses high. 70% also said relations with their former bosses had been low. Now, nearly all of them said they felt better off for changing jobs, and the rest said they were at least as well off. 55% said the job change caused no problems at home, and one-third said their home life was better. Almost two-thirds of those polled said they got more enjoyment from their new jobs, and significantly... 87% said salary was the most important aspect of any job rather than job security. Firing a man who does not fit into the job you've hired him for can be, and in fact almost always is, the kindest thing you can do for him. Forgetting all about getting the kind of job you want done for the company and finding the right man for that job, keeping a man in a job he's not doing well is to keep a man unhappy and frustrated and keep him from finding the job that's right for his talents and abilities. But most companies will go to almost any length before letting an unsatisfactory employee go. Management will procrastinate, vacillate, and sit on the fence sometimes for years before facing the inevitable. In the meantime, everybody suffers. A man in the wrong job might not get up the nerve to quit because of any old port-in-a-storm philosophy. 
since he's busy working at a job for which he's ill-fitted, he has no time to look for more rewarding and more satisfying work. He knows he's unhappy in his present work, that he's not doing the job that's expected of him. He's often nervous, irritable, and depressed. And since none of us likes to blame himself, he will often blame his company or his superiors or those in his charge for his problems on the job. When actually no one is to blame except his superiors for not facing the fact that they've got a round peg in a square hole. I remember reading of a survey in which a group of very successful men were questioned as to their past jobs. Even though most of them had never thought much about it before, they had to admit that they owed their present success to the jobs they had lost in the past. Whether they had resigned or been fired made no difference. Everybody gets unhappy with his work from time to time. Now, that's natural. But if a person has been unhappy with his work for an extended period and knows deep down that he's in the wrong job, he should get out of it. The deep-rooted fear of being fired goes back to the old days when jobs were few and far between and when any job was felt to be a matter of survival. Times have changed. Unfortunately, the feelings of management have, as a rule, not changed. There's a wonderful balancing mechanism in the world that operates to protect and make available great opportunities for the underdog. It works with countries, businesses of all kinds, and people in every walks of life. This is because of the fact that as a country, business firm, or person becomes successful and affluent, there is a tendency to relax and to take success for granted. This accounts for upsets in sporting contests of all kinds. It's what makes a small, virtually unknown company or nation move up into the front rank or spells the difference between a person's being average or great. It all hinges on quality, quality of product or performance. Now, some time back, Raymond Lowy, the famous industrial designer, wrote something for This Week magazine that will give you an idea of what I'm talking about. He wrote, Quality control is a modern industrial concept which requires that every product be checked against established standards to make sure that nothing defective reaches you, the consumer. But the principles of quality control have much broader uses. I believe that nothing great has ever been achieved, whether by a nation, a business, or an individual, without quality. People will turn to you, follow you, support you, only as long as they are confident that you are doing your best. Now we're at a point where that belief is being put to the test. This country and its people are in a massive race to maintain our leadership against other nations in trade, training, goods, and taste. This is a fight which cannot be won for us by some remote, heroic spaceman. It comes right home to every office, factory, and workshop. It's a fight measured more in actions than in words, and one where our country loses a little each time any one of us lets his standards fall. This fight is lost in little ways, by faucets that leak, windows that rattle, windshield wipers that don't wipe, lights that flicker or don't last, zippers that jam, engines that smoke, containers that leak, colors that fade, salespersons who are rude, repairmen who are untrustworthy, artists and artisans who do their second best, designers and manufacturers who think it doesn't matter just this once if they turn out products which are vulgar, shoddy, and overpriced. Mr. Lowy is right, as each of us knows. But as I mentioned earlier, there is a balancing mechanism that works to reduce quality almost in proportion to success and affluence. And if this tendency is to be overcome, it can be done only by constant attention and stress on quality control and by the relentless training and retraining of the people responsible for production and quality control. With success comes the tendency to relax and take things for granted. And that's about the time that the team nobody thought could possibly win pins your ears back for you. People are going to buy the best product for the money, and they don't care where it was manufactured, which is as it should be. And we could lose our affluence to competing countries if we relax our individual efforts. The sloppy worker is the unhappy worker. There is no joy that surpasses that which comes from the knowledge of work well done, a fine service rendered, or the clean out of an excellent product. Here are some interesting questions for you. You might want to try answering them. One, if you could completely change places with any other person in the world, would you do it? And who would that person be? Two, if you could work at any job you could choose, would that work be different from the work you're now doing? Three, if you could live in any part of the country you want to live in, would you move from where you're now living? Four, if you could go back to, say, age 12 and live your life from that point over again, would you do it? 
Studies indicate that the great majority of people, even though they evince a certain amount of dissatisfaction with their present lives and don't seem to be as happy as they might be, will answer no to all four questions. They might at first say they'd like to change places with another person, but when pinned down to identify the person, draw a blank. The thought of sacrificing all their friends and loved ones and giving up what they might have becomes too overwhelming. As far as changing their work, most people will admit they are dissatisfied at their work, about 85%, according to the research team at Princeton, New Jersey. But if they were actually asked to leave and seek something else, would stick to that that's familiar. As far as living in some other part of the country, if the answer is yes here, it is usually a part of the country with which they are not really intimately familiar, but which sounds romantic or has a better climate. If they really wanted to live there, they'd move. And the thought of going back to age 12 fills most people with a dread bordering on horror. They wouldn't do it for anything. The upshot of the whole thing is that most people are living lives that they themselves have fashioned and have or are getting what they really want, or at least what they're willing to settle for. And when this is brought to their attention, they often begin to get a lot more enjoyment from the life they've got. They begin to enjoy themselves more and realize that things aren't so bad after all. They also begin to look at each other, their marriage partners, and their children in a new light. As one man put it, it had never occurred to me before that my wife had, by marrying me, dedicated her entire life to me, our home and our children. This is an enormous commitment, a total commitment. And I realized I'd been treating her far too casually, that I'd been taking too great a gift for granted. We talked it over and got on much better, much warmer terms with each other. I guess it all goes to prove that a reassessment of ourselves and our lives is a good idea from time to time. It makes us realize how much more we can do with the lives and circumstances we've got, how we can improve upon them and embellish them with a little thought and creativity. I found it interesting. It's been written that life is divided into three terms, that which was, which is, and which will be. Let us learn from the past to profit by the present, and from the present to live better for the future. The body operates best, it seems, when there is a great deal to do, when we're challenged, when there's a goal involved. Take these things away, and apathy and introspection set in. We're turned in upon ourselves, and we can usually find something to be sick about, sick physically or miserable and sick emotionally. Moreover, we're at our most cheerful when we're busily engaged in something that needs to be done. And the times to watch out for and plan and prepare for are those times just following the completion of an important event. People are let down, at odds with themselves, and often terribly depressed, just following the completion of something they've worked and planned for for a long time. For no good reason they can think of, people who have just completed a big job, no matter how successful it may be, often fall into the deepest depressions. I'm reminded of the story of Thomas Hagen, who wrote the play Mr. Roberts, one of the most successful shows ever to be produced on Broadway. He was only 28 years old, attractive, healthy, talented, rich. The play was earning him about $9,000 a week in royalties. Yet he was found dead, a suicide, in his duplex penthouse apartment. Now, this may be an extreme case and a long way removed from the inexplicable depression suffered by a young mother following the birth of a child she's looked forward to for so long, but it remains a fact that when a person finishes a big job, he soon needs another. This is why successful writers keep turning out more books, and why the daily work of most people is much more important to their well-being than they may realize. So when you have to drag yourself out of bed on the cold, gray, rainy morning, or tackle the laundry of the dishes, if you can't be grateful, which you should be, at least recognize that it's probably keeping you healthy. There's an old Arabian proverb that goes, He who has health has hope, and he who has hope has everything. And someone said, turn to your work as though your life depends upon it, for perhaps it does. Surveys have shown that most women get married between the ages of 19 and 21, 19.5 to 20.5 to be exact. Most of them think of marriage as something that will take the place of a money-making job. Somehow these giddy girls are failing to get the word. Statistics show that if a woman has both a husband and children, she will work for a paycheck for 25 years. If she has a husband and no children, she will work for a paycheck for 29 years. And if she, for any one or more of many good reasons, remains unmarried, she will work, as does a man, for 40 years. Statistics also point out that the great majority of females reaching the age of 19 or 20 are decidedly ill-prepared for anything other than non-skilled jobs. They're not prepared for non-skilled jobs either, but 
That's what they wind up doing because they lack the necessary training and education to do anything else. To the best of my knowledge, hardly anyone, parent or educator, tells a girl when she is 12 or 15 that no matter whether she marries or not, she will in all probability have to work for a minimum of 25 years. And that since she will have to compete in the world of working people, it's decidedly to her best interest to prepare for a job that she'll find interesting and which will provide her with a good, if not excellent, income. Most love stories have traditionally ended with the young, starry-eyed couple, their early problems overcome, getting married. That is, most fiction ends where the real story actually begins. And here we find a young woman usually totally lacking in marketable skills, and with only the rudiments of a general education, with three-fourths of her life still ahead of her, starting out in marriage. She's one of the world's best examples that people would still rather learn through trial and error than from the experience of others. For her, marriage was her goal, often her total goal. Get married and join the club. Okay, now what? A study made by Michigan State University turned up the fact that married men are happier than married women. It also turned up the rather interesting information that single women are happier than married women. Oddly enough, and contrary to popular opinion, bachelors are the least happy people. And in my opinion, one of the main reasons why married men and single women are happier than married women is because both are still actively caught up with the world. They're busy, productive people as a rule. This is not to say that wives are not busy, nor productive they are. They're the hardest working people in the world. But they often find their lives boring and unchallenging after a while, and this is because they stop learning too soon. They still have ample time to prepare themselves for rewarding and stimulating work, but few do. Most take the line of least resistance and settle back into a kind of apathy and watch the world go rushing by outside their windows. And when the day comes that they want to or have to start looking for work, they have a problem. Whether she needs to or wants to work or not, every girl should train for a career of her choice. It will bring interest and independence to her. It's also a great way to meet the right sort of man. The international affairs analyst Herman Kahn, he's also a physicist, mathematician, and Defense Department nuclear strategist, made a forecast a while back which predicts a rosy, cheerful finale to the remainder of the 20th century. He predicts that for most of the world's teeming multitude, some six billion people by the year 2000, the last third of this century will be peaceful and increasingly prosperous. For our part of the world, the picture Khan paints borders on the idyllic. He says that we will have entered a post-industrial phase of such easy street affluence that many citizens may decide they don't have to work anymore at all. The big change from the gloom of the 1950s to the present optimism is that chances for a major thermonuclear war are now low. In the 1950s, he feels the probability was high. The world was lucky not to have had an all-out nuclear war, he says. For this country, Khan sees nothing but wine and roses all the way. By the year 2000, that's close now, Khan sees the disposable income per household reaching 25000 a year. It'll beat that. But according to the story in Business Week magazine, there'll be some traffic jams. One-fourth of the total U.S. population will be living in bus wash. That's the Boston-Washington urban complex. One-eighth in Chippets, that's Chicago-Pittsburgh complex. One-sixteenth in San San, that's Santa Barbara-San Diego. He forgot the peninsula of Florida, which will be probably the fourth largest. As our affluent snowballs, there will be more job dropouts. That is, people who simply quit working and hobbyists who will work two or three months a year in order to pursue some avocation the rest of the year. But Khan expects most of us to keep plugging away to pay for more of the good things of life. All this could lead to what Khan views as a wholesome decadence, if you can imagine such a thing. The biggest problem for the U.S. and Canada and other leading nations in the last third of the century will be the search for meaning and purpose for an answer to the question, what's it all about? It's wonderful to think of a completely affluent society with poverty and much of disease, a thing of the past, but affluence will bring with it new problems, new challenges, some of them as far-reaching as any we've ever known. And I think Herman Kahn is right when he says the biggest problem in the last third of the century will be the search for meaning and purpose, for an answer to the question, What's it all about? I think this is what's bothering so many young people today. Living as they do in an affluent society with all their basic needs met, they've had to turn to other questions and seek other answers. And this trend will doubtless continue and grow more widespread as we move toward the end of the 20th century. Men must seek answers to problems. Remove one set of problems and he'll turn to a new set. 
And if the day should ever come that he runs out of problems, he's going to be in a worse fix than he is today. In Kenneth Good's book, It's Easier to Win, he writes, Artists like to decorate public libraries with neural paintings of mankind struggling upwards in flame-like yearnings toward nobler things. The struggle, as a matter of fact, has been mostly in the other direction. Mankind in a million years or so of evolution has fought savagely against progress. He's right there, you know. In fact, history proves that attempting to lever mankind up a notch or two out of his stagnant hog wallow was one of the best ways ever devised to get yourself ridiculed, stoned, locked up, tortured, drawn and quartered, or crucified. Civilization has been administered in the mass, much in the manner of a mother scrubbing her boy's neck and ears, and has been received as reluctantly. Modern man, all the billions of him, may owe all his culture and most of his comfort to the imagination, determination, and energy of just a few thousand individuals. Comparatively few of these are embalmed in biography, autobiography, and history. Fortunately, these few did, in passing, store up a set of rules reliable enough to make success fairly certain for those willing to follow in their footsteps. Furthermore, and fortunately, the struggle to win these days is easier. The world is larger to beat, of course. On the other hand, through this comforting sense of size, society comes gradually to be tolerant of even first-rate achievement. So if you're interested in making a first-class effort to win a temperately chosen goal, here are Kenneth Good's seven steps to winning. One, focus the goal, bullseye all immediate objectives into a single goal. Two, Project the direct line. Survey the straightest, simplest way for you to reach that single goal. Three, fix a definite date for arrival. Four, schedule a program for daily delivery of achievement, which, rigidly kept, will bring you to your goal by that fixed date. Five, control your rate of progress by regular comparison with the prearranged schedule. So, like a railroad conductor, you'll always know whether you are on time. Six, Deliver from within, by physical and emotional self-operation, the greatest power your person is capable of producing. Seven, reduce, by studiously advantageous presentation of your project, resistance from without. Anyone willing to do these seven things and capable of doing them effectively enough to count is virtually guaranteed winning at any undertaking. Keep in mind, too, that you have very little competition in today's world. The overwhelming majority of people are quite content to go along as usual, operating on from 5 to 15 percent of their real capacity and realizing for their efforts 5 to 15 percent of what they might well be realizing. Another book you might want to add to your collection is by the anthropologist and social critic Dr. Ashley Montague, entitled The American Way of Life. In it, he comments on many aspects of life in America, one of which happens to be the pursuit of happiness. And he writes that the pursuit of happiness in America is perhaps the most misconceived of human endeavors. Life and liberty are indeed necessities, but the pursuit of happiness is a fool's game, a will-o'-the-wisp that eludes all who believe that by making it a goal, they can, by the prescribed or some other means, achieve it. The truth is, and it's not a sad truth, that happiness cannot be pursued and caught like a butterfly in the collector's net, it defies pursuit, and all attempts to contain it are vain. Nor can it be purchased. It is one of the many things that money cannot buy. The truth is that it is not the purpose of life, of a human being's life, to be happy. Perhaps this is a shocking statement to those who have been conditioned to feel otherwise, but it's nonetheless true for all that. If true, then millions of human beings have misspent and are misspending their lives. What is happiness? The answer to that question is not a matter of definition, but rather what most people mean by happiness. What is it that they desire for themselves and for others when they think of happiness? Apart from the obvious requirements of health, money, an attractive spouse, gratifying children, a beautiful abode, esteem, prestige, recognition, wit, wisdom, valor, love, and the attainment of whatever one has set one's heart on, what other ingredients should go into this cake? Possibly a good many others, but this will be according to each person's fancy. My own view, he writes, is that not one of these conditions is either a necessary or a sufficient condition of happiness, although one or all of them together may give some people a feeling of whatever they consider happiness to be. But such a feeling soon loses its power to please, as in time one returns to the steadying level of everyday life. I believe with Aristotle that the steadiest, 
and most enduring states of which human beings are capable are states that are characterized by an absence of pain, physical pain and mental pain. Such states of the positive absence of pain are appreciated for the most part only when they're interrupted, as by the experience of illness or bereavement. It is in the state when one is least conscious of oneself that one is likely to be at one's happiest. What folly it is to believe otherwise. To believe that those occasional peak experiences, those thrilling moments when the goal one has set oneself has been achieved, or it just feels good to be alive, or one receives an unexpected windfall, or one's work is highly praised, or likely to be numerous and prolonged, is silly. Such occasions are indeed memorable, but the feelings of euphoria they engender do not endure, nor should they. The moments of happiness we enjoy take us by surprise. M, but sees us. It's not so much the pursuit of happiness as the happiness of t that is most likely to yield the desired gratifications, and then only occasionally. It is work, work that one delights in that is the surest guarantor of happiness. Someone sent me a magazine article titled Success, Sweet Success. Unfortunately, the name of the magazine and the author are missing, but I found it to be very good. It goes, success, sweet success. Everyone wants it. Everyone achieves it in some measure. Few seem to get enough of it. Some don't know they have it. Others forget what they're really striving for and why sometimes it's necessary to try to define success for ourselves. What is this thing called success? Is it complete achievement of our grandest goals born out of honesty, industriousness, and thrift as depicted in Horatio Alger's stories? Or is it a contrary illusion, always tempting but never attainable? Does fate give it to some on a golden platter and deny it to others in spite of all efforts? Who, for example, do we consider most successful? An expert mechanic or the president of a company? An accomplished teacher or an affluent financier? The man who gets an excellent job done quietly or the one who performs equally well under the limelight? Being perfectly honest... Don't we identify success with fame and fortune? Even in church, don't we give the nod to the brilliant leader and ignore the quiet man in the back pew? Isn't this a serious mistake? If we're to identify success with the badge of fame or the accumulation of wealth, where do all the solid successes of modest individuals fit in? Few of us can wear a success badge or a conspicuous price tag. How then can we recognize our true importance to our family, our company, and our community? Wanting success but lacking its fleet appreciate our solid contributions. The answers are personal, and self-appreciation of our own successes comes only when we live up to our talents and goals the best way we can. Real success consists of using our talents to the utmost, and when this is done, we need no badge or price tag. Crawford Greenwald has said, Unfortunately, we take life at its most superficial and conclude that achievement can be measured only in terms of applause or wolf whistles or financial compensation. But if in the years to come we can look ourselves in the eye and say with complete honesty that we've used to the utmost the talents with which we have been endowed, then we'll be successful men and women, quite regardless of the stature we have in the eyes of the world. We need to remember, too, that there is no significant success without corresponding failures. The difference is that successful people learn from their mistakes and refuse to quit trying because of them. Mark Sullivan came about as close as anyone ever has to the key for success when he said, to find a career to which you are adapted by nature and then to work hard at it is about as near to a formula for success and happiness as the world provides. Add to Sullivan's statement the conviction of Thomas Wolfe when he wrote, If a man has a talent and cannot use it, he has failed. If he has a talent and uses only half of it, he has partly failed. If he has a talent and learns somehow to use all of it, he has gloriously succeeded and won a satisfaction and a triumph few men ever know. Success depends on knowing our talents and our ability to use them to the fullest. For those who can do this, success is theirs. Thank you.